I had a problem once. I bought a watch. I sold it to an AP authorized dealer. It came back stolen. Oh. They run it through a database. This watch is stolen. They confiscate the watch. Basically, I'm fucked. $43,000. I called the guy. He's like, the best I can tell you is I'm sorry. Like, what do you mean I'm sorry? So you don't want me coming. They're going to the police. I don't want to rat you out, but it's 43000 No, let's negotiate. Now in Dubai, if you buy a stolen watch, automatic jail time. So if I get the letter from AP, and if I go to the police, say, listen, he sold me a stolen watch, and here's the letter, and I bought it from him, he goes to jail. They know I let it go. My boy was like, I'll get the watch back for you. I said, how? He's like, don't worry. He said, I need this and this watch for 60000 This guy in Dubai said, I have it. I said, please tell him to ship it to you, and then you'll pay him once you get it. Mm -hmm. So it works that way. If we have a trust, you need a watch, I ship it to you. You'll pay me in a day or two. I trust you. He shipped it to him. <laughs> Should see the watch from LA? I call him again. I said, bro, you want to pay me my money? No. I sent him a picture. I'm like, is this your watch? Says, <laughs> yeah. You want your money back? 60000 sitting in my safe. All right, Moshe Hamoff, welcome yeah. to the podcast. Thank you. I said uh, the last name right? Yes, sir. Okay, perfect. Thank you for having me. Sorry, guys. Um, I have to say I appreciate the way you've you treated me as of now. Like the, the, the honor was all mine to come here. I feel flattered and honored to be here. Oh, man, I've been watching you for a while. And so uh, I was like... I wonder if he'd be on, you know, be on the podcast. And my travel schedule is a bit crazy, so I gave you yeah. like, I was like, hey, that's gonna be, you know, I'm here next week, but uh, I'll be back in Nashville the 18th, and then I think the third week of January, and you're like, I'm free next week. Yeah, I'll like, yes! Actually, today and tomorrow is my that's three awesome. days, and I go back. There's Thanksgiving, then we go back to Friday. We're open again, so we go back to work. So I said, I'm, I said I'd come here. Why not give it a shot? That's awesome. Is this your first time in Nashville? Yes. Okay. First time in the South. Uh, well, welcome. Had and a Nashville uh, uh, fried chicken already. That shit was spicy, but it was... Oh, you got the hot chicken. The hot chicken, whatever uh, it's called. What, what yeah. level did you get? No, well, they didn't give me a level, but it, no? was, it was in the in the hotel, the kitchen. Oh, I got what's you. That, what's, I got that, you. That, what's that restaurant called in the hotel? Kitchen Street or something? Yes, yeah, at the Omni? Yeah. Tonight, uh, I've got dinner reservations um, at a really good restaurant for y'all. Yeah, I can't wanna wait. Want to join me. I can't and, wait. Uh, we'll show you the city a little bit. I would love to see the city. I'm 42 years in here, so uh, oh, wow. this is my town. So you were born here? Yeah, born and raised. Wow. Born and raised. It's been changing a lot. I was going to ask you right now. It hasn't changed since oh, my gosh. you grew well, up here. Nashville's blown up in the last 10 years. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, when I grew up, it was more like a really big town than even a city. And so, um, you know, very family-oriented, you know, felt like everybody knew everybody right. uh, then. And... Uh, you know, it's it's changed a lot, you know, to where now it's one of the uh, fastest growing cities in the country. I think I read that more there are more cranes in Nashville right now than anywhere in the world. And that's how much building is going on. And, uh, you know, I, I like a lot of it. I just want to make sure you know, my, my concern is we're still in the soul of our city in a way. And I want to keep that from happening if if I possibly can or yeah. my friends possibly can. But it's cool. It's fun. I mean, like, you know, where you're at couple blocks away from Broadway. Yeah, I you know, heard Broadway's about Broadway. a lot of fun. Man. I heard. It is. I heard. I got to go see it. I got to listen to the music also. The yeah. Southern music. Was it country music? Was country it music, country yeah. Country music. Yeah. It'll be country music, and then you'll go into a country bar and they'll be playing some gangster rap, so it's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> you know. New York City It's style. not just country. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so uh, tell the audience, uh, and I could give a little background. Um, you know, you're known as the Watch King. On uh, Instagram, I mean, I guess that's your store name too, right? The Watch yeah. King? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. It's, it's a name we came up with. I came up with a couple of years ago, driving home from the... T I had a couple of company names, and I, I wanted to go on social media, like, see what's a, what's a catchy name, what's going to be. So I'm in the tunnel listening to sports radio. That's what I do. And uh, I'm like, what name am I going to put? And then the first name that popped in was Watch King. I said, you know, it sounds cheesy, it's whatever, but whatever, fuck it, who cares? So I just put it as Watch King NYC. And um, the past year has been uh, amazing. For... Yeah, so, so when did you get that name? Thinking like, about it on, uh, um, I don't even, driving home. No, I so said when, uh, when, when, oh. did you, when did you uh, go Ooh. with it? Uh, 20, right, uh, before COVID. Okay. It was before COVID. Before COVID, but I said it's going to be a cool name for Instagram. That wasn't my company name yet. Mm -hmm. But then I transferred over to be, once... It took off with TikTok as well. I said I'm gonna have to call my, I have to rename my company to Watching NYC. Cause that's what people know me as. So now we go on the street, people see me. Hey, Watching, Watching, Watching. That's awesome, right? They recognize me. You with the long hair. Uh, my hair is not that long. I mean, it's longer, <laughs> but not that thick. Reads the ponytail. Yeah. Right. Somebody offered me one time. 
ten. I was saying to Barbie that like, I'll give you ten grand if you cut your hair. What? I said no. Yeah. Would you do it for ten grand? No. Twenty grand. No. What's the price for you to shave your head? Shave it? I wouldn't even do it. Yeah, probably a half a million. That's exactly my price. <laughs> so I said half a million. I'll cut the ponytail. If not, because that's the trademark, right? People know you. Probably know you from your hair too, and because you used to be a fighter or whatever. But me, they know me only because of my ponytail. So yeah. if I take it off, plus I have identical twin brothers, so they're gonna get confused. The only uh, way they can tell the difference now is by the ponytail. That's funny. Yeah, it would it would cost me half a million dollars, a lot of money, but uh, I'll do it for half a million. Yeah, half my million. hair won't grow back, but it's okay. <laughs> I'll just go bald. Yeah, then you got yeah, then you got to. <laughs> Just wear a crown the whole time. And be a yabaka. <laughs> there you go. Like back in the day. Yeah, so uh, tell everybody where you're from and, and like, uh, kind of what's your background. So I was born in, and raised in New York City. My parents are from Israel. I know it's a very sensitive topic to talk about. But that's, I'm proud that's where my parents are from. Um, I was brought up uh, in an ultra, ultra Orthodox Hasidic household. My dad is the chief rabbi of the community. Um, grew up with no TV, no internet, no books. So my education, basically reading is like a sixth, seventh grade level. Like I can't read or, you know, never, we went to school, but school is all about the Bible, the Torah. You have to learn. That's all they taught us about. And English studies was like, doesn't matter. You're not going to need it. Um, I finished my rabbinical studies at 22 and, uh, I decided that it's not for me anymore. So I left religion when I was 22 years old it was very hard for my family so basically I never worked a day in my life till I was 22 because mm. my dad would tell us you know um I'll support you as long as you learn because how am I going to make a living he's like I'll give you I live in Israel then he's like I give you 10 grand a month in Israel 10 grand a month wow. is fucking that's a lot of money like a, you know not really a third world country but in Israel it's like it's not like here in New York City 10 grand a month you can't even go through the month but sure. in Israel it's like wow it was 2000 and 2000 and, 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 f and 2006, when I started, like, went to rabbinical college. I finished high school, went to rabbinical college. Mm -hmm. Sorry, 2004. They'll give you 10 grand a month. You just study the Torah all day till you're a rabbi, and I'll support you. I'll get you an apartment, buy your car. So I learned, 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 learned. 2009, my dad lost his money. 2008, when the economy crashed. Like, listen, I can't support you anymore. You got to get a job. So uh, can I cuss on you? Oh, yeah, all you want. <laughs> I told my dad, sorry, f fuck you. Not, not fuck you, like, Goodbye and fuck the religion. I'm out. I'm gonna go get a job. I went to 47th Street. So we in New York City. So you City, went from Israel to 47th Street? I went back home to okay. New York City. Mm -hmm. I graduated, went back home to New York City to become mm -hmm. a rabbi. So okay. I was a rabbi in Miami and I was giving lectures in, in synagogues and, you know, and working in restaurants, like cleaning the. So we have to clean our lettuce. It's a whole kosher process. I don't know if we have time to go into how the rabbis work. Like, so yeah. basically, we can't have lettuce from the street. You gotta wash it three times with soap. Make sure there's no bugs. You gotta check if there's bugs in there. Same thing with the meat, right? We we have to slaughter the animal first. Then 24 hours, you can't let it sit. You have to salt it for 24 hours. You can't just eat it right away. You gotta salt it, let the blood soak out, and then you can eat the meat, right? So if you slaughter 200 uh, a sheep, 20 become 20 are kosher. The rest are you gotta sell not even for a profit. You gotta sell it for cost. Interesting. And what is that? Is that, that from the, the Torah? From the Torah. That's what, that's what the Torah says. That's what I, lear I learned. Um, basically, at 20, I had no job. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. At 22, I went to 47th Street. 47th Street is a diamond district in New York City where it's between 5th and 6th Avenue. Literally every... Like me and you are right here. We, we share... Like I'm a watch guy. You're a watch guy. And really, that's how close we are. Right. Literally like this. There's a bunch of booths buildings one long avenue block if you ever been to new york city you'll see and i went to get a job there because that's all i knew i'm not educated i never I finished high school i don't know anything i can't go to college nobody's gonna fucking hire me i don't want to work in, you know anywhere else i said i'm gonna go to the streets where all where all my boys are i went there i went for an interview a guy offered me a job for i think it was like 400 dollars a week to make cold calls to sell diamonds to store i said fuck it huh. i'm gonna take it i went downstairs my boy saw me he's like why are you so miserable i said listen i don't have a job i don't have a career i'm I left the cult by myself. <laughs> he said, okay, I'll teach you the business. This was 2009. <clears throat> he said, give me 50, yeah, 50,000. I said, yeah, I'll get it. My boy, Gabby, God bless him. <laughs> and um, that's what happened. I, my, I bought my first AP for $11,000, Audemars. Sold it for eleven eight. I was like, fuck. I mean, $800 in five minutes. 
I'm in. And that's yeah. what happened. And yeah, so how did like so you know you did that and uh, you made eight hundred dollars. What was your next move? You had to, like you bought. I bought another watch. Yeah, and right. And how I did started it go? buying and I started flipping. So at first I started flipping, buying for eleven thousand, eleven eight. Then I bought a sub. I remember like yesterday a D serial. D serial is a two thousand and five, four five, maybe even two thousand six. I'm sorry. Yellow gold Submariner, black dial. Never forget this watch. I love that. So I'm gonna fucking keep it. I'm gonna keep it. I'm not selling the watch. I'm wearing a yellow gold watch. I was. I thought I'm the shit. <laughs> I bought it for ten thousand. Today the watch worth twenty grand, by the way. And a guy's like, I'll give you ten five. So I told him, Gabby's like, sell that. I said, no. He's like, he told me give a rule. Don't fall in love with your own supply, my friend. Yeah. Sell it. Everything's replaceable. Make money, you sell. That's what I did. I sold that. Then I sold another one, another one, another one, another one. But it took me like. To really learn the business solidly it took me three years. I was under Gabby's wing for a year, a year and a half. He taught me the business well because he's an old timer. He's we, we're the same age, and he literally helped me through putting myself on my feet. And from there, I started buying and flipping, buying and flipping, buying and flipping, till I went to um to Asia. Then I saw a whole different world. I had to go knock on doors to look for clients and whatever. Then I started doing wholesale to the to the to the to the stores. So if you ever come to Forty Seventh Street, even I'm sure there's Nashville jewelry here or something. Mm -hmm. I would sell to people like that. I would go on a plane, go to L.A., go to Miami. In New York, I would land. There would be a line of people buying my merchandise. And I'd go back every other week. Did it for ten years. You were what part of Asia were you going to? I went a lot to Japan, Hong Kong. And so do they have um, Singapore. They have uh, is a I don't say manufacturing. I know manufacturing no, is there. They it's the biggest. Ones. It's the biggest um, hub in the world. Okay. For the watches, like it's the market indicator, right? Wall Street is the market indicator in the financial district. Mm -hmm. in the world, in our industry is, is Asia, China, China, not Hong Kong. China controls the market. Their dealers control the market. Their economy controls our market. Really. So if there's no demand in China. The market is going to start declining here. So it goes there first, then we get it a month or two later. We feel it by us. There's no demand. People stop wanting to buy, right? Because it's a luxury. Well, but don't people want uh, different watches here than they like in China? Or does China? Correct. That's a very good question. So you're 100% right. <clears throat> Asian people are typically small. So they like sport models, Submariners, GMTs, Batmans. We like big watches so we buy day just day dates gold and the sky dwellers and, and yacht masters but if they're not buying the sport models right then they're not selling their yacht masters yeah interesting there's no trade there so now that the supply and demand so right? so you you were in asia buying watches there that's where that's what's kind of setting the market mm -hmm. um you know you spent what you said nine years doing that 10 years 10 years going back and forth I still um, do it till today. So, you know, doing that, do you just have, do you just like know what the price is and I'll watch just, watch just by seeing it? Correct. So what you do is it's like, um, it's like, like you go into a store and there's a sale, right? So you just pick, oh no, I said, it's the wrong analogy. It's like you, you, you go into a store, there's no time, right? There's somebody behind you. If you don't buy it, he's going to buy it, right? There's three left. So you buy, 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 buy. Then you go home and you can, you can return, mm -hmm. right? So you go home, you buy that shit, you go home. Same thing with the watches. I'll buy, I, it's like, you know, watches are it's expensive items. 10000 some watches are 100000 200000 I don't inspect it. I buy it fast. It's literally one day. Then I inspect after I buy. So I buy from somebody, let's say, like you. I trust you. I'll buy from you. If there's a problem, you'll trust me that I'm saying the truth. You'll know it's the problem and you'll refund me my money. That's yeah. how it works in our business. So all, everything is a, a word. There's a word called mazal. When you say that word... It's like a contract. It's, you you buy it. It's like you. you it's a commitment. Yeah. It's no backing out. Oh, I don't. Uh, let's say you say Moshe, I have a watch, and, and you have a story. You say Moshe, I have a watch. Ship me this sky dwell. I said it's thirty eight thousand. Okay, Mazel. Ship me the watch. You can't call me tomorrow and say, Yo, my customer didn't show up. Too bad. Mm, okay. If that happens, then we don't work together anymore. That's how it works in our industry. Interesting. Right. So the same thing we do over there. In Asia, it's called confirm. They can't say Mazel. They say confirm. So once you confirm a watch. It's yours unless there's an issue, right? Then he tr we have to. There's a trust. So this whole business is based on trust. I know tomorrow you're not going to sell me a fake watch, aftermarket parts, right? Even though some eighty percent of the watches have no box and papers. Yeah. 
correct? Right. Yeah, but right. I trust you enough to buy from you. Yeah. So if there were and if there were an issue, let's say you uh, made a deal in in, in uh, somewhere in Asia, and a watch turned out to be fake, they would give you the money back. Like this? Yeah. No questions. I had a problem once. I bought a watch. I sold it to an AP authorized um, uh, AP authorized dealer. It came back stolen. Oh. They run it through a database. This watch is stolen. They confiscate the watch. Basically, I'm fucked. Forty three thousand dollars. I'm fucked. Right. Call the guy. I'm like, yo. The watch was stolen. Really? I didn't know. I said, no problem. I get a letter from AP. I get a letter from the detective that it was stolen. I show it to him. He releases my money. And it goes back. It trail, right? It goes from me to him to him to who he bought it from till it reaches the, the first guy who, you know? Sure. And if there's a guy who says, I'm not paying you back, then there's repercussions. We get it back another way. You What's know? the other way? We take... <laughs> One time I had an issue. Somebody also sold me a stolen watch. I was in Dubai, actually. So I go out to Dubai, too. Mm -hmm. I So... Sorry for getting off track. Dubai, yes. Arabs cannot wear, Muslim men cannot wear gold. It's haram. So they're not allowed to wear gold. Really? Yeah. You know that. They can only wear steel or platinum. They cannot wear gold. Hmm. So I would go there to buy the gold watches because they hmm. can't wear it. And I would sell it back at home in, in New York City or whatever around the country here. Because we wear gold, we don't give a shit. We wear the hell of They can't. In a sense, each country has their market, which I learned as I was traveling there. You understand? Yeah. So I bought a watch from Dubai and AP, another one, came back stolen. <laughs> I called the guys. Like, the best I can tell you is I'm sorry. I'm like, what do you mean I'm sorry? Now in Dubai, if you buy a stolen watch, it's automatic jail time. So if I get the letter from AP, I had the letter. And if I go to the police, say, listen, he sold me a stolen watch and here's the letter and I bought it from him, he goes to jail. Wow. I, that country is no fucks given, man. It's <laughs> run like um, you steal, you get punished. Not like, yeah. you know, you do shit... Nope. Not like you get you, you get arrested and they let you out the same day. Exactly, bail reform. What's it called? Bail reform in New Something York City. Something like that. Yeah, Five, you go for two hours and get the fuck out. We have no room for you. Yeah. And they commit another crime and get the fuck out. New York City is crazy, bro. Nine hundred dollars you can steal. Up to nine hundred dollars you can't touch the guy in your store. Really? So you go to CVS. Everything is like you want shampoo. It's fucking locked. You gotta press the bell for the guy to come to get his shampoo because some freebie wants to fucking steal that shit because he's allowed yeah. to. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Adams. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I need my money back. He's like, the best I can say is I'm sorry. So listen, you don't want me coming there going to the police. I don't want to rat you out, but it's 43000 No, let's negotiate. Say, no, I let it go. I saw he needed a watch. My boy needed, my boy found out. My boy was like, I'll get the watch back for you. I said, how? He's like, don't worry. He said, I need this and this watch for 60000 This guy in Dubai said, I have it. I said, please tell him. To ship it to you, then you'll pay him once you get it. Mm -hmm. So it works that way. If we have a trust, you need a watch, I ship it to you. You'll pay me in a day or two. I trust you. That's sure. Because you know, we work together. He shipped it to him. <laughs> he called me. He's like, Moshe, I have the watch. I said, ship it to me. He shipped me the watch from LA. I call him again. I said, bro, you want to pay me my money? No. I said, no problem. Look at your watch. I sent him a picture. I'm like, is this your watch? Huh. He says, yeah. So you want your money back? 60000 sitting in my safe. That's the way you're going to get your money back. That's awesome. And he paid me within three months. He was like going back and forth. Oh, I said, do what the fuck you want. You owe me money. You sold me a stolen watch. Pay me my money back. That's all I'm asking for you. Why do you think that somebody like that wouldn't pay you? Like just being a shady dude or did he get it? Like Some people don't want to take responsibility. Yeah. Sounds like a lot of other yeah. problems we have in the world. Exactly. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> no response. <laughs> I mean, but yeah, your, your group. You know, the people that you know in, in New York, they won't do business with him anymore. Of Never. Course, like, so we all, like, everybody, so I asked, all, first I asked all my friends to help me who buy from him. They, uh, they, everybody got political all of a sudden. No, because they're making money off this guy. I said, mm -hmm. bro, he's fucking me for 43 grand. Like, big deal. It is. Yeah, you I know, And anyway, half the watch they buy from him is anyway stolen. If this one came back stolen, how many more is he selling stolen? Exactly. Well, no box and papers, right? And yeah. he, won't, he won't even, like, man up to it. Say, oh, listen, I'm sorry, I didn't know he's your money back. He would say no. Right. So now that every now one of my friends had the same issue with him, so slowly, slowly everybody start started like backing away from him. That's when you need one person to ruin your name in our business, and it's over. Yeah, you won't get a penny credit. That's good. Then That's I go good. on the street and I'll get fifty million from everybody. Wow. But I can't. I have a name to right. Right. If I one time don't pay, it's everywhere, and my name is to the ground. Gotcha. So a name is worth more than money. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Yeah, I was uh, actually talking to my, my girlfriend about it and talking about, you know, she doesn't care really what people think per se. And I, I get it. Um, get, I understand where she's coming from. But, you know, you do have to protect your reputation. Correct. You know, it's, it's, it's everything when it comes to business because if people uh, don't trust you, Correct. then um, they're not doing... Correct. They're not doing but she's right. You. Like, rep, I don't care what people... Like, when I left the cult, I was very nervous in the beginning because people are going to talk. People are going to talk. I learned today that they're going to talk about you regardless. Mm -hmm. Whether you're amazing or not, they're always going to find something bad to say about you. Yeah. All, all I need to answer to tomorrow is God. Was I a good person? Did I conduct business correctly? Did I steal? Did I do something wrong? God's not going to judge me based on my, uh, that I pray three times a day or that I eat kosher and that I bl make a blessing or God, okay, maybe that's what he wants or whatever, but I'm sure he, more important to him is that I'm a good human being to society. I contribute to society, help people, help yes. others be nice to people, you know? Yeah, so absolutely. Also, I understand what she's saying, like she doesn't care where, what people think about you. Not, not in business, so right. in general, in life. Right. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I, I agree with her too. I think there's some nuance in it within the, you know, your reputation is yeah. you know, in many ways everything. Like you're talking about, you know, with trust uh, with people. And I know, like I always try to be overly fair. Like when I'm doing, when I'm, I'm in a kind of a weird situation, I mean, like my go-to is what is fair and then what is undeniably fair. And sometimes I, I give up too much, but it's worth it because I don't want anybody thinking I'm trying to screw anybody. You got to lose the battle to win the war. Exactly. You know, big picture, what, yeah. is, what does it really matter? Or they say penny wise, dollar foolish. You know, those people, you know, count their like, right. you got to just look at the big picture, what's going to happen tomorrow. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess, uh, so, so you went to, uh, you were going to Asia for 10 years. You're still, still going back, back. How often do you go back right now? Every three weeks now. Every three weeks. Yeah. Wow. And so you go there, you meet with 17 the 17 hours. Flight. Man. Yeah. Gotta get up and I have anxiety. I have fear of flying. Oh, and I still do it. Every, coming here, I almost shot my pants. The plane was shaking. I was like, oh, my God. You gotta get that again. jet. It'll make your life a little. What? You gotta get that jet one day. Even the jet, even worse. Private planes, I heard, are the number one, like, <laughs> it's riskier than getting to. I think the prop planes. Yeah, the actual <laughs> jets, you know, it's not It's not so bad. No, I, it's expensive. Ticket's not cheap. No, it's not. Ticket's not cheap. But listen, you do what you gotta do. It's be, but you know what? When the plane is not shaking, it's so peaceful. Yeah. You know, it's really peaceful. When the plane has turbulence, I start getting anxiety. But if it's not, you clear your mind. You know, you sit there and you think about what's going to be when you... So when I land, I go straight to work. Nice. Right? So, you know, Asia is 12 hours ahead of you. Some mm -hmm. 12, some 13. Depends. Japan is 13 hours from here. 13 hours ahead. Hong Kong is 12 hours ahead. Thailand is 11 hours ahead. Uh, who else is 11 hours ahead? I think Manila. So basically, th they're half a day ahead of us. Yeah, you should know. I do this. It takes a day to get there, a day to get back, and I'm there for three, four days, and I come back every three weeks. So I'm always fucking jet lag. Yeah, man, always. That's a lot. Yeah. So what do you? So so you just uh, where do you normally fly through when you're going to? So now places? because since since COVID finished, since after COVID ended, um, it became harder to get flights directly to Hong Kong. Mm. So I'm a Jew, and us Jews hate to spend money. So to spend 20000 on a ticket, I'm like, fuck, no, there's a way to do it. So I learned the point system. <laughs> okay, that's good. So um, what you do is you buy tickets first till you reach a certain amount of points. Mm -hmm. So usually they have a Black Friday sale in November. I would buy November, let's say next this Friday. Mm -hmm. Cafe Pacific will have a sale. I'll buy 12 tickets for 12. So I go, let's say, 18 times a year, I'll buy 12 or I'll buy 10. Then the other six, seven times, I'll fly for free. Oh, that's smart. Yeah, but now it's, it's not like that anymore. So I got to go either through Japan. Or through uh, LAX to Hong Kong, or New York to Hong Kong became almost impossible flights. unless you pay twenty five thousand. Oh my, my gosh, my jewel ass ain't paying twenty five thousand <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> to fly for seventeen hours. Yeah, that's I did when I first started, but as I got older, I learned the system. A guy named Brian Kelly, you ever met him? I oh, know points guy. He's huge on. Uh, I've seen him there. I've seen the points guy. He's huge. So I, uh, I got. I talked to him a little bit one time on the plane. He was buying, he wanted to buy a watch for me one time. Sky Dillow, we're talking back and forth. And he actually helped me uh, learn the system. That's what he does for a living. Yeah, that's awesome. So so you buy 12 tickets. Yeah, I used to. You used to. And they, they don't let you do that anymore? No. I mean, we'll see Friday. I will see Friday. I don't know this Friday what happens. But usually Black Friday, I wake up. Like at midnight, they would tell you it was a Black Friday sale. Cathay will send you an email. Yeah. Like $4,000 round trip. 
Okay. What other, what other so points tricks 12. do you have? Huh? <laughs> what other points tricks do you have? <laughs> Let me know. It's the best trick in this. The best trick. The best. I'm telling you, you can fly to Dubai on Emirates. You ever flew Emirates first class? I have not. The 380, bro. There's a there's a bar in the back. There's a fucking shower on the plane. You oh, have wow. 30 minutes to shower. The bathroom is the size of this room, but not width, but length, like this. There's a shower over here. Huge bathroom. It's huge. Not like those, you know, you go on American or Delta and you got to take a piss and you're tall, so you got to duck and that shit's hitting you and <laughs> you're pissing everywhere. Yeah. It's a whole different ball game and 130,000 points. So you have Amex? Uh, no. Chase? Yes. Yeah. So you have over a million points? Oh, yeah. I got it probably about five right now. How much? About five million points <laughs> on, on, the, on, the different, on the different cards. We get three times the points, for instance, like with uh, I'll teach you Instagram all and Facebook, you three to one. So you, you do uh, spend 100,000, you get 300,000 points. Wow. They let you do that up to, I think, 600,000 points. So You have the Sapphire? Yes. Or the Ink? Uh, the, I believe the Sapphire. It's still good. Um, you can fly anywhere. Five yeah. million, you can fly for a while. Yeah, we can Not go. Not pay another penny. I tell you what I got a lot of is uh, Marriott, uh, Bonvoy. Yeah, I do that too. So when uh, the, the stem cell patients go to the hotels, it's under my name. So, like, I've, I've stayed technically, I think, 283 days. Holy shit. Yeah. But how do they let them check in? I don't, you, they being I don't know how it works. I got my, st my staff figured it all out. I said, hey, because uh, we made a deal with the hotel. I was like, but, uh, you know, have it under my name. And he talked to the manager, and the man manager puts it under my name. Um, and then it's so-and-so under my name. But I get the, the points for it. You're, you're, over, you're probably over platinum too, right? Oh, I'm on that one. Whatever the... Uh, <coughs> Whatever the top one is, it's over 100 nights. It's Ambassador Elite. So I'm almost there. I'm at 75. Yes, Titanium. No, Platinum. Platinum, Titanium, Platinum. Or something. I think Titanium 75, uh, Platinum 60, and... I have to check. I don't yeah, know, something like that, but... The best rates. I use the app, and... Do you get 4, 4 p.m. checkout, too? Yeah. Man. That's the best it thing is. ever. It is. I just get it, even though I don't need it. I was like, yeah, I'll take 4 p.m. Yeah. Just leave me alone. <laughs> exactly. It's awesome. Um, you, you know, uh, who's with uh, Marriott is the Cosmo in Vegas. You ever go to Vegas? They just started. Yeah, yeah. They, they've been... They, they, I saw that. Cosmo. All MGM hotels. I heard... All MGM was only Cosmo. I heard All MGM bought Marriott, but All MGM hotels. I I'm think. not sure about that. I know Cosmo is one... Because when I go to Vegas, I stay at Cosmo, and I always get a sweet upgrade. But you can do it on the app? Uh, yeah. I tried last time. They didn't let me. Oh, yeah. On the... On the uh, Marriott. Bonvoy app? Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I, unless something's changed. I, I've stayed there three times this year. So That's why I want to stay. Yeah. I mean, you can. You got to stay at the win, but then I got to pay. It's outrageous. You know, win is super expensive. And I love the win as well. But like now that I'm such a, I'm a ambassador elite with Marriott, I'm like, uh, I'm sticking with Cosmo. I, I stayed love for hotel. free in Vegas for many years. I used to be a big, big gambler. Oh, really? So I went to rehab for, I lost all my money. Gambling. Oh, man. 2000 and. 13. What, what did you uh, gamble? I went to Atlantic City every day. Oh, man. And Vegas every fucking day. You know, played blackjack, poker? Uh, Baccarat. Uh, okay. That game killed me. Uh. I was I was so broke one time when I lost all my uh, I lost money. So they charged me for parking, and I was short 30 cents. And she made me go outside and beg people for the money. I asked for the money like a beggar. I drove home. I was crying. I said, I'm never going to do this again. I swear. And the next day... I went right back. Oh, man. Lost another $18,000. I remember it like yesterday. I said, listen, I lost everything. I lost my house. I lost everything. Wow. I was broke. And I said, I got to go to rehab. Yeah. So how so long? Six, eight months, I lost almost a million bucks. I was 20. Shit, what am I? 37. I was 26. Really? Yeah. How long did you go to, to rehab for for that? Two years. Two years. But I went to I went to rehab for like thirty days. Then they gave me the AA book to read because it's basically the same. Then I went to a therapist for two years. Every week he would test me on the book to see if I read it. So you read the book, yeah, all right. So show me your highlights, and he would test me on it to see if I did it. You know. Yeah. And since then I haven't gambled anymore. That's awesome. Thank God. It's an That's addiction. Awesome. Which so I would go to Vegas for years till last year. They know they don't give me free rooms. So they they had the hope that I would come back and drop yeah. one hundred fifty thousand again. Man. So now I and I go to Vegas five times a year for work. So I work with a lot of people in Vegas. I sell a lot of people in Vegas. We have conventions in Vegas for watches. Mm -hmm. I don't touch the table. Yeah, like doesn't even doesn't even I don't have the I don't have the itch anymore. 
Yeah, I'm the same way. I don't, I don't, I don't gamble. Uh, j- just in general. I mean, like uh, every now and then, because I'm in Vegas a lot, and uh, we have an office there actually. And uh, I'll stay at the Cosmo or wherever, and, and maybe I'll get a couple thousand dollars out. But it's I don't want to sit for a long time. I'm like, you know, four or five hands. If I double my money, I'm great. If I lose it, it's like, ah, no big deal. Yeah. But that's it. I don't I don't like sitting in. You know what? What I found probably this happened. Gosh, I'm 42. This is like 20 years ago, maybe a, a little longer. Uh, I wasn't very much past 21. Uh, I was drinking at a table one night. And I kept going back to the ATM. I just drained my ATM. Whoa. And I didn't have money, you know? I didn't have that much money. I was just a kid. And uh, I was like, never again. I didn't do it but again. But you have self-control. You're a fighter. You well, have, you, you know, I, I was an opiate addict, actually. No so way. when you said you're an addict, yeah. So I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, yeah, so uh, 2008, I tore my LCL, PCL, meniscus training fighters. Ooh. And uh, we had team doctors that gave me prescription pain pills, Um uh, just, you know, I was just taking them. And, uh, for about two years, um, I went to stop and I went to withdraw. And, um, I, it was really hard for the next six months. I tried to stop multiple times, wasn't able to do it. So I went to a therapist and I asked him, uh, you know, I was like, Hey, I, I'm functional running my companies, but I'd rather have a clear brain and deal with the pain than foggy brain. Uh, and he said, America is behind the times when it comes to opiate withdrawal, what? Google Ibogaine. And ibogaine <clears throat> comes from the Tabernathia Roga boot in Gabon, Africa. It's what the Bwiti use for the rites of passage ceremony. But uh, it supposedly stopped 100% of opiate withdrawals. Like hardcore heroin addicts were taking this and, and getting off it. I was, I was skeptical, but I watched a couple documentaries. I was like, you know what? I Doesn't believe it. Try. I believe it. And so I flew to Mexico City, took a bus a couple hours south uh, to a place called Tepoztlan, Mexico. Uh, it's a really cool place called Iboga Quest. And... Um, I did ibogaine, and I was home seventy-two hours later. Never had a withdrawal. Never had a wow. craving. Haven't had opiate uh, since. It's amazing. So, um, yeah, but I, you know, addiction is something. It's crazy. You, know, you see what's happening right now in society with like fentanyl, and I had a friend two weeks ago um, die of fentanyl. Um, he was doing cocaine. A lot of my friends died from that. Died of fentanyl. They just overdosed by accident. By too, accident, but they just take them. It's awful, you know. And you know, you think about. Uh, there's probably about. I mean. There's under 30,000 people under the age of 40 that died of COVID so far. Uh, but I bet since 2020, if you add it up, I'm kind of doing the quick math in my head. There's probably been about three, between two and 300,000 people under no, the age no, of 40 that cares. died of, you know, so you're at what? Eight to 10 times as many people uh, under the age of 40 um, have died of fentanyl overdoses than died of COVID. Right. But you don't really hear about that. It's not political. It's not. And so that's why, yes, but I, I have a lot of compassion for people with addictions because yeah. I, I had an addiction that you shared your, your I had addictive. I still have addictive personality and my, my addiction is work. I want to grow my company, grow the business as far uh, to, to go as far as it can. Yeah. That's what I do it for. That's what I use my addiction for. Cause I'm very an extremist, either all in or all out. Mm-hmm. I don't have a middle, which is bad. Yeah, I'm the same way, but <laughs> sometimes it takes you there, but sometimes it can take you there. Hopefully we'll, you know, it's going to take me to the top. Well, that's why it's important to be around good people, though, right? Correct. I mean, you are who you surround yourself with. Yeah, we have what, great, what's your group like in, in, in New York? I have a group of 10 employees there. Mm-hmm. So I hire kids straight out of who are high school or college dropouts. They don't, they're not good for school. And they come, learn the business. You'll make money. Forget about it. You'll make money. You'll make more money than a doctor makes, I promise you, if you do it right. Yeah. More than the plastic surgeon went to 30 years. What the fuck? 20 years of school. You'll make more money. You, won't, might, you might not be educated, but... You'll make money. Well, that's okay. I mean, it's like this, uh, you know, the, the education system is one path, but, yeah. you know, when Some you people, have a trade. Like, I'm not meant for, for college. I, I have ADD, right? So I can't focus more than five minutes on something. I'll, I'll have to do something or jitter my feet or something, right? So a lot of the kids have it, but instead of putting them, I believe, on medicine, yes. let them work. Yes. That's what I do. I, I make them run around, work. Post on sites, do social media for me, do this, do this. And they, they work, they make money. I have a kid, he's 18 years old, he makes almost $15,000 a month by me. Just uh, on commission. 15000 yeah, yeah. a month? Yeah, $15,000 a month on commission. Wow, good for him. He's yeah, 19. so I, I saw that in the video. So that's one of the things I really liked about you. Um, I saw you talking to a kid, trying to help him. Uh, that why, you know, said, you know, one day come back or, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I we'll love teach you this kids. stuff. My dad's a teacher, my dad's a preacher. So mm-hmm. I have it in me, but unfortunately... Sorry, Dad. It's not for religion. It's for work. I try to give back to to the young guys because you, 
I was taught, so I believe I was taught I have to teach somebody else. Can't be greedy. You know what I'm saying I'm not gonna take it with me to the grave, right? Yeah. Absolutely. I believe if I help somebody in life and have a positive impact on him, he'll do good to society. Instead of telling him no, 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 go learn by somebody else, then why am I here for? Okay, I made money. Okay, I enjoyed. Okay, I went out. I did everything. What am I here for anyway? To leave a legacy, leave something good for somebody, right? This kid say, oh wow, he impacted my life. Like, you know, just like somebody, Gabby, impacted me. Yeah. I was 22. I was lost. Literally lost. And he put me on my feet. And then he could have said, no, fuck you. I'm not teaching. Why would I teach my... Why would I create my own competition? They were competitors, but we're best friends. That's all. Yeah, what, like, so how did that happen? You went to him and said, I want to... You know, I'm, he came I'm to lost. me. Okay. He saw me outside. He's like, why are you so sad? And I said, bro, I don't know what I'm doing in my life. I have nothing to do. I left religion. I have no money. I'm broke. 22 years old, never worked a day in my life. What am I going to do? That's how he started. That's what he, he's like, come, I'll teach you. He didn't have to take me in. Why would he take me in? Who am I to him? Okay, we're friends from childhood. We took our road test together and uh, big deal. So we're friends out of work. But it, he's also a teacher. He taught a lot of people. He taught me, then he taught another one of my friends. And everybody he taught became, because he told me, I was taught. When I was 16 years old, I was on the street. Somebody taught me. He's giving back. That's what... That's what I love to do to these kids. I have a kid now, 16, dropped out of high school. I bought him in. So I'll give you $1,000 a week plus 10% for now. Mm -hmm. Commission on the net sales, whatever, net profit. And sure. if you want to be on commission based only, then I'll give you 20% commission on net, whatever you sell. So he's like, I want the salary first, but that's no problem. That's awesome. What, 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 when people come to work for you, kids come to work for you, uh, what's the process of teaching them? Nothing. Just sit and watch. And ask a thousand questions. And ask, a th and always, I always teach them when they come in, always listen. You don't know nothing. Till today, I listen to my elders, people who are older than me. I've been doing this for, what, since 2009. I always ask questions. Even if I'm sure, I like to get an opinion from somebody who's not in my situation. Mm -hmm. If I want to buy a watch, it's 300,000. My brain, I said, I'm going to sell it for 330. Right? Profit margin is not that big. If I'm lucky, it's 10%. Usually it's 2, 3, 4, 5% max, but we rotate. Every month, money's work comes in, comes out, you know? So I call a boy of mine who's, I'm like, yo, what do you think about this wallet? Should I buy it? And if he says yes. And every time he helps me, I call him. I said, since you helped me, I give you the opportunity to partner with me on this watch. If you want to. If not, you know, as a courtesy. So I'll call this to Clay, Ed, sorry. Let's buy this property together. And you say yes. Mm -hmm. Say, okay, you want to buy it with me? Because you gave me the advice. You say it's worth it. Here, come in. That's what we do as a courtesy when we ask advice from somebody. So I do it all the time. That's awesome. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, helping kids, uh, yeah, something yeah. that I really care about. I mean, I had a mixed martial arts school for a long time. And yeah. Over a thousand students and a lot of kids, you know, at the school. And the kids suffer. And we just don't know what they're going through, right? You see it in martial arts all the time. Oh, yeah, man. They let out their anger, their anxieties, their fears. Everything you see in, I'm sure you saw how many kids went through your door? Oh, I don't even know. Thousands probably over the years. You probably helped thousands of men become, kids become men. Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, hearing, like, I, I love the fact that, you know, they're, they're kids that are dropping, like, it's not great that they dropped out of school, but maybe that is the right decision for them. Yeah. And they have an opportunity because, you know, there's a trade. And, you know, uh, would you say that pretty much anybody that learns the trade can make anybody. a good living? Anybody. It's got to be honest. You got to be straight and you'll make money. You don't need to go to school for this. Buy a water for a dollar, you sell it for a dollar twenty. It's very simple. The difference is everybody drinks water, not everybody <laughs> needs a watch. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. That's absolutely. what you need to learn. So everybody has their own niche in this business. There's a thousand watch dealers. Each one has their own niche. So I do wholesale and I started doing social media. Some guy sells to retail stores, some guy does repair, some guy does polish, some guys I don't know. Each one has their own like calling, as they say, to the business why God put him in this business. You know, that's what I believe. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, since you kind of blew up on Instagram uh, and the internet, how, how has that, you know, helped the business grow? Tremendously. People come in every day. Pictures. They want to buy from me because they feel like they know me. Oh, I trust you. I know you. I want to buy from you. I trust you. are not going to screw me or whatever. I'll tell you a story. A guy walks in a week ago. Literally a week ago. He has a, he has a, a meteorite Daytona on the Oyster Flex. That watch is so fucking hard to get, all right? The watch, he probably paid 30000 it's worth seventy on our market. On the gray market, it's worth double the retail. 
So he's up 30,000. He doesn't know what the fuck he has in his hand. He's like, I want to trade this. So he's, he's a white guy, comes with his wife, probably some doesn't know anything about watches. He's like, I went to Baltimore. I found it in the AD. You got lucky. Hmm. I want to trade it for an AP. So if I was a fucking asshole, I uh, will bend you over right now and hit you so hard over the head, I'll tell you no problem, but I can't do it to you. Listen, what you have in your hand is worth $70,000. I'm not going to let you trade it for an AP. Now get the fuck out of the store. He oh, said, wow. thank you so much. Man. I felt too, like, I don't know, I couldn't do it to him. I couldn't. Like, fool him and whatever, because if he's going to go home, he's going to see it, and he's going to be like, oh my God, he screwed me. Yeah. I mean, that sucks. But that's like looking at big picture. Yeah. You know. He's like, next time I want to buy a watch, I'm going to come to you. I said, don't sell this watch. Buy the AP and leave this watch. That I'll do for you. Like, you know, I'm going to save money. I'm going to come to you because you're honest with me. Thank you. And it's fine. So I didn't make 30 grand today, but I eventually he'll come back because I built the trust with him and he's going to tell his friends and his friends are going to tell their friends and his wife was with him. She's going to tell her friend and, you know, it's worth more than 30 grand to me. Absolutely. Absolutely. You don't look at the small picture like you say, look at the big picture. Look at the big picture. I mean, that's, so So in the walk, uh, watch industry uh, in New York where you're at, you know, what would you say the biggest lessons are? Life lessons. Hmm. Always keep your word, man. Always keep your word. Walk with your head down. Listen to others. Don't disrespect others. There's a fight there every day. Right? This competition is so big so much is a fight every single day so the block is safe from new york city is a shit show right you get robbed if you walk anywhere today because hmm. they're allowed to bail reform so on 47 <clears throat> between fifth and sixth avenue there's cops everywhere so you can walk around with a million dollars in merchandise nobody's gonna fucking touch you because hmm. they know there's they're ready Counterterrorism is there so everybody with guns ak's waiting because we pay them like they get paid to Diamond District, the biggest diamond district in the world. You go a block over, you're getting fucked. Literally in three seconds, you're getting stripped naked. Wow. They're robbing you with merch if you have merchandise. Um, so, but there's fights and there's competition. So there's fights. The other day I saw a hawk. He's like, oh, you stole my customers. Oh, you shut the fuck up. Boom, knocked them out on the street. Cops are going to do nothing. Business as usual. That's how, that's how it is. It's cutthroat. <laughs> it's, it's, it's action. Every day there's drama. Every day there's something going on, you know. But there's mutual respect. I know the guy next to me will not screw me because he has a name to care of, right? And always listen to your elders, people who are older than you in this business, people who were there before we came in. But number one thing I think I learned from that, from the street is that your word is your bond. Whatever you comes out of your mouth is what you said, is what you have to do. If I said tomorrow... I'm going to do this and this for you. Then he knows I'm going to do it because that's what, I, that's what the street taught me. The 47th Street taught us. There's no contract. Right. You buy a house, you go under contract with attorneys. Yeah. There's no fucking, you buy a million dollar watch with no contract with yeah. the word mazal. And that's it. Yeah, it's so interesting that that's how, how y'all operate because in many ways, so Scott and Dedrick are my two partners and we just brought on Francisco a couple of years ago who's the, the scientist that I was telling you about earlier. Um, but, you know, people have always said that we're not gonna not gonna make it. You know, oh, you know, you're eventually gonna fight. And we've lived together uh, in Mexico for the last nine years. I Man, I'm, I'm coming back and forth uh, more now, but we have a condo together. We wait in, in the beginning. We would wake up, we drink coffee together, we'd work all day long. You know, into the night, go home, eat dinner together, talking about business the whole time. Uh, wake up, do it again. It's just like it was. It was all of that, and uh, didn't have. A contract between us uh, have have our specific shares. We know what they are. Um, of course, it says it in the LLC. But um, we've done so many things like that without contracts. And people are like, "Oh, why would you do that?" I'm like, honestly, the way I look at it, and 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 we will have contracts for certain things with customers. But if someone screws me, like it's on them. Like I, I'm just not going to deal with them anymore. They're dead to me. It's right? like, yeah, I'm just not, we're just not going to do it. Yeah. But um, you know, when you have that level of trust, to me, for business. It's a better way to operate. And I understand like big pharmaceutical levels and some of the stuff that we do, we have to have, you know, we have a ton yeah, of lawyers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but, you know, for the most part, I like doing business with a handshake because I wouldn't do it if I didn't trust the person. Correct. You know? That's how we work. Uh, my partner now, my business partner, Zalman, you see him on my video sometimes, mm -hmm. the little <clears throat> chubby kid, we lost Matterweight. He's younger than me, but everything, we are partners based on word. Even mm -hmm. LLCs on my name. Mm -hmm. 
but he trusts me. Mm -hmm. The bank account is on his name because Chase threw me out. Mm. Well, some Chase doesn't like jewelers or whatever. So they, I'm in a different bank, in a different bank. But it's everything based on, you can tell me tomorrow, listen, we have no money in that account. I'm fuck. But we yeah. trust each other. It's like, it's a trust. It, like you said, there's no contract between us. Nothing. Yeah. We're 50-50 partners down the middle. He runs the operation. I'm the face. He runs all the back end work. We have a service center. We have whatever the hell you want. Like it's a whole museum over there. He runs the whole operation. It's all him. It's all based on the word. I'm not there today. He can probably take thirty thousand. I won't even know, but he'll never do it because I trust him with with everything. Yeah. Same vice versa. He trusts me with everything. I go to Hong Kong with two million dollars and say, oh, "I'm sorry, I got robbed," but he trusts me. Right. Right. That's that's what we have. We have a. A bond, yeah. as you say, or a word. Well, I think it's going to sound funny saying this, but I think trust is underrated. Correct. I mean, it's like I see, I see like uh, how people operate these days. Right. And I'm like, you just got to build a, a trusting relationship. Like I have a ton of friends. I'm blessed with a ton of friends. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say. I, I know who, who my best friend is growing up. And, you know, Scotty, I would say, is my very best friend. But I probably got 15 to 20 other best friends as well. I got a lot of close people and uh, a lot of good friends after that, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, and I, and, and like my, my girlfriend, she's like, gosh, how do you have so many friends? I'm not saying to brag, I'm just giving the conversation, but uh, I'm like, well, uh, you know, uh, I trust them and they trust me and they know sure. that they can count on me and vice versa. So um, that's really an underrated thing. We built our business CPI on trust, our relationships in the MMA industry, uh, having people that trust us. They knew Scotty and I from back in the day. I mean, we were very involved in the sport for a, a long time. And, uh, you know, not screwing people over goes a long way. Exactly. Not the 30000 you make today. It's about the, the relationships you have tomorrow where you can make 20 times more because of honesty and trust. Your trust is very overrated. Underrated, I'm underrated, sorry. Yeah. Very underrated. Yeah, absolutely. Very Unfortunately, most businesses don't have trust. There's partners that fight over stupid shit. And right. There's this greedy partners who are stealing from each other. It's stupid. It's really stupid. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I, I, I hear you about you. You know, bringing the uh, younger guys into work. Yeah. And uh, yeah, those are good life lessons for them too, because you know what you might see on social media or. Um, you know, maybe people are raised and, oh, you can't trust people or, oh, you do things this way. Um, when in reality, it's kind of backwards thinking. It's like, no, you, you can generally trust, you know, if people screw you, then you, you got screwed. Don't, don't deal with them again. Right. But, um, you know, as long as you're honest and you follow through with your word, you do what you say, you admit when you're wrong. Exactly. God forbid you number admit one, when you're wrong. Number one rule. Yeah. Always say sorry when you're wrong. Yeah. Some people just won't do it. Yeah. I have a twin brother. He'll never say sorry. <laughs> no. Identical. And we, he will never. I know he's sorry, but he won't tell it to me. Right. Because <laughs> it's his pride. He won't do it. Is he a rat? Was he a rat? No, he actually owns a, a, a franchise of, of, of like, it's called Smash House. A delicious uh, burger joint in New York City in Miami. He opened one a year ago. He's already on store number three. He's opening four or five this, this coming year. And it's like a kosher, like Shake Shack. Nice, a kosher shake shack. So basically you can't have, uh, <clears throat> Jews cannot have uh, cheese and meat together. We can't have cheeseburgers. Oh. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> Trust me, I know. So I won't take you for a cheeseburger later. No, I'll, I'll eat it. Okay. <laughs> i eat it. Sorry, Dad. But I've, I've eaten it and I eat it or whatever. But um, they cannot have it. The, 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 that was my biggest thing. When I was religious, I have to try a fucking cheeseburger. You ever yeah. been to L.A.? The Vegas? Oh, you ever yeah. went to In-N-Out? Uh, oh, yeah. I love In-N-Out. Oh, my God. First thing I do when I fucking land. You get In-N-Out. In L.A., I go to the fucking In-N-Out by the airport with my suitcase, everything. I got to have that double, double animal style. I have to. Yeah, it's so good. So my brother opened it with kosher, but the cheese is not real milk. It's like it's like soy, but it uh, tastes like fucking real cheese. I see. So the Jews are going crazy. Like, <laughs> what the f But it's not. They know it's not real cheese, right? So he opened that, that type of concept, first time ever, and he took off like crazy. That's awesome. So, so he started, uh, you said, uh, in New York and now in... He started in Miami. Okay, sorry, Miami. We went to visit together <clears throat> a long time ago. And, How'd that go? In the restaurant business. Horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I love him to death, but he's, he's different than me. So I told him, listen, let's stay brothers. 
you know, we're very, we talk every day. She's the only one in my family I actually talk to every day. Okay. Everybody else are more like, whatever. I'm like, how do you say it? Like the black sheep, so I'm more like on the outs. Now my parents got older, they, we have, we're getting a better relationship, but past 10 years it was really like, whatever. So um, uh, my brother I talked to every day. So we started a business together, actually a pizzeria. That was my, my I wanted to do with him. And, I, and we got, we fought every day. I said, Benji, let's stay brothers. His name is Benjamin. Benji, short. I said, let's stay brothers. I'll leave. You know, you do your shit. I do my shit. If we ever need to help each other, we'll be there for each other. That's what we do till today. We have a bond that nobody can break. Even my parents say it's not right. You have other siblings. I say, oh, this, this, this is me. Is my other half. I'm very close to him. Like, we're identical twins. So I yeah. feel, I feel. One time I'll tell you a crazy story. Sorry, we're going off topic yeah, here. Yeah. Sitting in the movie theater, I was 16 years old. And in the middle of the movie, I felt somebody punch me in my stomach so hard. I said, I got to call my brother. I called my brother. He just got into a car accident. And I mm. felt it in my stomach. I got hurt. I felt the, like a stab. Yeah. I was like, wow, that's how close attached we are to the hip. So we talk every day. We run ideas by each other every day with his business and my business. Like, you know, because I'm his biggest critic. He's my biggest <laughs> critic. But it's good. Yeah. Criticism is good. That's how you grow from criticism. Right? But we can't we can't work together. We tried again a few months ago and it didn't work. Like he bought into my business, I bought into his business. I say, yo, let's just Yeah again. Well you can try, but now you know you yeah, know it's, it's, a reminder, it's better this like, way. Yeah. It's better this way. He's more in, he got more spiritual, he's getting back to the religion a little bit. So I like you know, I'm way out of it. So it's not going to work out of religious wise. Like, I don't want you doing this. I say, you know what, bro? I, I'm not good with rules. Don't tell me what the fuck to do. Don't tell me what to do. The only time is the creator. That's all. Nobody else tells me what to do. With. Here's your, because my dad was a dictator. My yeah. dad was led with an iron fist. Oh, you want money? Do this. Yeah. You want a car? Make sure you only take it to, to, to school to learn the Bible. If not, you can't take the car. You want a phone? Do this. You're not going to do this? I'm going to take it away from you. Yeah. Right? That's how we were raised. My dad's the best father in the world, but. Uh, when they came to religion, he was fanatic. Mm -hmm. Like radical. You know, there's radical terrorists, Islamic, there's radical Jews too. Interesting. Orthodox, radical, rad where you do this or God's going to punish you. Or the same thing, unfortunately, same brainwash. For example, an innocent child who's born in a Muslim house, Palestinian child, you think he's born to raise to hate a fucking Jew? No. He goes to the school. When they say, hate this motherfucker, hate these Zionists, hate them. He grows up, he grows up, he grows up. The hate builds into him. Then he mm -hmm. becomes a suicide bomber. Mm -hmm. But I always, I always want to ask the child, why don't you ask the rabbi, the, the guy who's telling you to blow himself up, why is he not dead yet? If it's what God wanted, why are you still alive? That's what I did in, my, in, in school also. Hmm. How so? When they would t tell me, if you do this, you do this, you're going to die. I said, how the fuck is this guy still alive though? What is, what is he preaching to me? Right. Right? I'm sure he sinned. Everybody sins. We're all sinners. But he's right. like, if you're a sinner in this. So every time, when I was younger, I had questions in my brain. What, the, what does it mean? Like, as I got older, you get smarter and you're asking yourself, what do you mean? This, it has to be a cult. It can't be real. It can't, you're telling me 99% of the world is sinning. Mm -hmm. They're eating not kosher. They're not dead. And I'm a Jew. I'm going to eat. I'm going to die. It makes no sense. They told me when I was 11 years old, 10 years old, if you eat recess peanut butter cup, you're going to die because it's not kosher. Yani, like, glad kosher. I said, bro, it's impossible. Yeah. Like, I see people eating it every fucking day. They're living. So I went to my twin brother. I'm like, Benji, we have to try. He's like, oh, I'm a, but I told him I'm scared because I don't want to die. And he's like, bro, we're not dying. I said, okay, you try first. <laughs> and when he tried and nothing happened, that's when I started questioning yeah. all this radicalism, like all this orthodox religious, you know, like you have to or you're going to die. Because they teach you God is evil. God's not evil. God is loving. Yeah, God loves his. We're all his children. He loves us. Okay, whoever believes in God. Some people don't. It's not whatever. I be, I respect them. Whatever. I believe in God. I believe that God is a father to us, and no father wants to harm his child. Right. Yeah. But in Orthodox religion, they teach you that if you don't do it, God's gonna get angry and he's gonna punish you. Yeah. So when I saw I wasn't like, you know, that's when I left. Yeah, I was raised Church of Christ, which is a strict Same uh, thing. Christian, and uh, you know. Uh, my parents were not near that strict, but you know the the messaging and, and the church actually. As I got older, I, I appreciate a lot of the stuff they were saying, but I also, you know, I look at the way it was put, as in you know these 
It's fire and brimstones, you know, constantly. You know, if you do this, you're going to hell. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, which th thinking about spending eternity burning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Fuck it, you might as well enjoy life, right? right? I was like, oh, this is awful. Um, but I mean, I, I understand it, it more now. And I, and, but I think a lot of the places that the, especially the, that type of church comes from, it's a place of fear. Exactly. And in, instead of faith. And as I've gotten older, I mean, my faith is stronger now than it's yeah. ever been. I feel like, you know, just a, a great connection. I pray yeah, I don't know every how many day. times a day. Yeah, a bunch, man. And well, what, uh, that's what God wants. He doesn't want us to be robots. Right. Just yeah. desires in this world for a reason. God on this, every man sinned. Doesn't mean you're bad. It means you had a desire, you failed, and you got up, right? How do you, when you're up here, when you come down here, you, you fall, you get up. You fall, you get up. You don't just stay down. Right. But they teach you, you fall, you're dead. But that's yeah. wrong. You don't, you're not dead. You get up, you try again, you do it. Sorry, you do it a thousand times if you need to. Right. By all they love you eat a cheeseburger, you're fucking toast. Well, I've been enjoying it for 10 years. Yeah. Best fucking thing I ever had. No offense. Like, you know, I wish <laughs> we're allowed to eat cheeseburgers. That shit. It's, I never tried bacon, though. Never tried pork. Oh, okay. I'm still scared. I, I, not scared. I'm still, that's my, in our Torah, it says you can't eat pork. And I say, no, that's my thing. I'm sacrificing for God. Like, uh, you know what, God, you don't want me to do it? Is it true or not? I don't know. Right. There's still my brainwash talking to me. Sure. I'm still in that. Even though I'm out for 15 years, I still have the, how do you say, the aftermath, the, the, the anxiety still. Because since the childhood, they drill your brain, right? Yeah. They drill it, drill it, drill it, drill it. So it's still in my brain that if I eat pork, I'm done. Yeah. You know, it's not true. My brother, uh, people I know eating around me, it's still, but. I ate pork. I know. I'm sure it's delicious and it, it looks is. good. One time I ate a salad. And I was like, this shit is so fucking good. What's in it? She's like, oh, there's a, uh, what was this sausage? And I was like, oh, fuck. Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> that was the best Caesar salad I've had in my life. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, man. It's it, it's interesting how, how the, the faith works, and especially you were highly educated in that. Yeah, and yeah. You say you're not educated, but that's an education. Yeah, it's, of a itself. Harder, it's harder education than, uh, than, than, let's say, becoming a, a lawyer. Yeah. Because there's certain laws and uh, so a rabbi is like a judge. So if we have we have our own courts, we don't go to civil court, right? Really? We have a rabbinical court. Yeah. Okay. So if you get married, you go to a rabbinical court. You don't go. You could do civilly too, but you if the rabbi didn't marry you off, you're not considered married. You can go to fucking city hall twenty times. You're not considered married in our religion. <clears throat> and then the rabbi is like a judge. If there's financial problems, between, let's say um, uh, A and B, they come to the rabbi. Whatever the rabbi decides, that's what you're gonna do. Really? He knows it because he learned it. So we have our own uh, our own court books, which we read it from the Torah. And they teach you money problems, real estate problems, house. It tells you, do this, do this, do this, do that, you know? And our religion is very pro-woman. Very. Cool. So a woman always right, you know? A woman doesn't have to do all these commandments because she's closer to God. A man isn't, so that's why you always have to worship God. A woman doesn't do nothing. Just to... Bring kids, and half of your good deeds go to her. That's how it works. It's very pro woman, and it's very. We have our own court system, our own judicial, whatever you call it, justice system, and that's what a rabbi. Is. So it's basically, I went to like a college of. I'm becoming an attorney. I'm not going to say that attorney is more of a talker than me, but it teaches you life like every day. Supply and demand. Oh, my partner fucked me with this. You have proof. You have this. Okay, let me see. The rabbi decides. He looks at the. You have to pay him, no problem, done. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. how it is across the board for the... Orthodox, yeah. Orthodox, yes. You, 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 if I, let's say I'm, so somebody's married, he wants to get divorced. He can't go to City Hall and get divorced. He has to go to the rabbi, right? There's a certain process what you write in the divorce paper. And the courts in America, um, if you get divorced rabbinically, like uh, Orthodox, they agree with that divorce. If you had an agreement in the rabbinical court and you go to civil court to sue the husband, just like, did you go to the rabbinical court? Yeah, you're not getting more child support. This is what you had an agreement already. Wow. Yeah, so they know it. Like, the system knows it. That's incredible. Yeah, it's incredible. And so, yeah, you said you were 22, and right. then you're like, I can't do this anymore. I couldn't do it because I wasn't I was not, wasn't happy. I felt like I was missing something. Yeah. Even though my dad always tells me you're chasing your own tail and whatever, but maybe. But I enjoy chasing my own tail right now. Yeah, that lived in a bubble, right? Well, it's like it's almost like 
freedom versus a, a form of like slavery. Correct. You know, like you're, you're stuck. You can't do anything. Correct. So you're. So I always told my dad, tell me the analogy. Hey, we're special. That's why we were the white shirt. And I said, dad, let me ask you a question. If you go into, I don't want, I don't know if it's very sensitive. So you go into a, a house of people who are, not, are mentally disabled. Mm -hmm. They think everybody outside is crazy and they're normal. They think with the Orthodox Jews, they're the minority. They think the whole world is crazy and they're not. But really, they're the ones who I believe are crazy. They live in fear. They live in anxiety. They live like robots, like sheep. The rabbi controls you. The rabbi says, jump. You ask him how high. You don't say why. How high do I jump, rabbi? Yeah. What do you think is uh, the good part about it, though? Religion? Yeah, but uh, specifically the... Always together. There's a case in our... In, 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 um, right now, what's going on in Israel? Everybody's together. Yeah. White Jews, black Jews, wherever you're from, religion, everybody's together. They need help. They send money there. Every, always together. So like I have to, to a lady, a lady in our community, her husband passed away with six kids. They paid off her mortgage, her kids' schools, college tuition. She has nothing to worry about for the rest of her life. Six children. They came together in the community. They paid off her house. Two million dollar house. They paid it off. No mortgage. They paid off her kids, all their elementary school through college, high school and college. All done. So she's left to worry. That's one thing they have. Somebody who's sick, somebody needs help, they always together. That's all they have is each other. Yeah. You understand? Well, it seems like, you know, as as we've evolved as a society, that you know, you could take kind of the best parts of that. And yeah. you know, there's probably other other forms of I'm gonna say the, the basically the same religion without being so strict yeah. that uh you know, more people can connect with. I mean, I was looking at, uh, I guess when I did the Ibogaine years ago, it's like strongest psychedelic in the world. And um, uh, I did it three separate times. And I was very anti-religion when I, when I was doing it. I was kind of, kind of really trying to find what I believed in. You know, I was raised Church Christ and things had changed. And uh, in the uh, trip, uh, I was asking questions like, you know, ha, have other civilizations been before and things like that. And, and I mean, I don't know how, if this is real, but this is what it showed me. It showed society, you know, we were, it showed not society at the time. It showed nothing but trees and nature. And then things start slowly building up. Yeah. Uh, and then by the end, it was all concrete and then everything blew up and then it started over again. And it showed me that it happened multiple times. Um, that there's been a lot of different civilizations that have come and gone. And then I asked about religion. And because I was, like I said, kind of anti-religion. And um, it showed me that it was actually really good to give people hope. And that without hope, you can't uh, have a functioning society. And it was very, very clear. And it, show, it, it was showing me the positive parts of it. And uh, it actually, that's one of the catalysts to bring me back to my faith more and to where even now with, with my Christianity, I couldn't tell you a lot of different things about the Bible. Um, but I can't explain a lot of the stuff. I just know I have faith. I know I can pray multiple times a day. It gives me comfort. Uh, I ask a lot of decisions like, God, what do you think I should do? Just, you know, and, and I go with it most of the time, you know, sometimes show you, yeah, you ask, he'll show you. Yeah. And so it's been, uh, yeah, it's been a kind of a, a cool evolution. So I say that because, you know, it sounds like you're, you have faith. Yeah. Um, it's just, uh, I don't believe, I believe religion causes a lot of war in the world, unfortunately. Yeah. You can see what's going on in the Middle East. It's all right. It's all about, I think it causes war. It causes, uh, it's good for structure. People who need structure will go to religion. Yeah. It keeps, right. There's, but I think religion can be a beautiful thing if you put it the right way. You teach it with love and. And acceptance and not evil, then it'll be beautiful. But there's modern Orthodox Jews that are fine. You know, they live, they're fine, but they're not extremists. They're mm -hmm. not radical, right? Then you have the same thing with what's going on. You see what's going on back there. Oh, yeah. In the Middle East. All, they're all fighting over what? We saw it happen over, over COVID, too, where it was just this kind mm -hmm. of this radical way of thinking that wasn't. You know, face mask, they would yell you on the plane, the lady, ah, uh, like, stop. Man, the, the first, <laughs> the first time I flew over COVID, it was April. And it's hard for me to like, you know, 
snap, but it, it was tough times, you know, so everybody kind of goes off every now and then. But uh, I was on an airplane in April 2020 and flew first class and there was nobody on the plane, but first class was full. <laughs> and it's, it's like, oh, these are people that have to travel. And so, uh, but I'm sitting next to a guy and I get, uh, go to get off the plane. We flew, uh, I was flying to LA from Nashville to LA. So, you know, four hour flight and I get up and uh, to get my bag and the guy's like so much for social distancing. And I'm like, we were just, we were just been sitting here the whole yeah, time. The whole time. And I pulled my mask off. I was like, fuck off. It was like, <laughs> but that was just the time. I was like so mad. You know, the, there was a lot of, a lot of that going on. They were, they were taught. People lost their from mind. The media was teaching them yeah. and, and manipulating them to think that uh, you have to stay away from You have to be six friend. feet, even though we just yeah. sat next to each other. The whole plane ride. Yeah, it's like, no where's sense. the common that sense? No sense? Yeah, there's no common sense. Yeah. And being bubblehead and all this, oh, it made absolutely no sense. But people believed. And I'm saying COVID is real, right? I'm not saying COVID is not Same. real. But so was the flu and so was everything else. And, you know, I had a close family member of mine, uncle of mine, who died from COVID out of nowhere. He got sick, went to the hospital and died. But it was the yeah. beginning. Nobody knew what happened. You know, it's sad. It doesn't mean that the way they shut, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, the way the country was shut down and the fear. People weren't breathing. Oh, it was it was a psyop. Man, I'm telling you, like, I, I don't ever watch the news, and um, I read a lot, and uh, I'll watch videos online, but never, like, regular news. But you know science. I'm sure you oh, yeah. you went with it with your scientists. What were they telling you? Um, it was a mix. It was a mix. Um, so <laughs> some of the sentiment was we have to tell the people one thing, but, you know, because they we have to get everybody to act, even though what we're saying isn't exactly accurate. That was kind of a known thing amongst a lot of scientists. Wow. Um, you know, I would argue because you know, they, they had the slogan, trust science, trust science, trust right. science. Well, you know, you put a dollar sign with that S, you know, trust <laughs> science. That tells you kind of what they're doing. But, you know, they, they made people like me, uh, people would call me stupid and uneducated when I'm actually like trying to actually follow the science. I'm like following the science. I'm reading the research papers. I'm like... They, they said this is the conclusion, but that's actually, that, that's what I was finding a lot during COVID. The, what they would say the conclusion was in the research paper wasn't actually the conclusion what the data said. That was weird. Um, and then you could actually see the bias in the research paper. So I'm reading, I'm like, boy, they are very biased in the way that they're, the, the, they're saying right. this. And they were trying to get society to think a certain way. And actually, you know, the scientists had fear of being canceled themselves if they made a discovery that wasn't what the mainstream said. Wow. So I, I read that a lot and I would debate with uh, a lot of different scientists that I'm, I'm friends with. And, uh, you know, they had their certain points. Uh, most of them, I think thought greater good than, you know, individual, I would have taken a completely different approach to, to, you know, what was done. Basically, you know, the data said pretty quickly within March of 2020, you could tell by the end of March of 2020, um, by those that have died, how you're going <coughs> to die based on your, uh, you know, body weight, age and those type of things. So if, uh, if they would have come out and said, you know, get on a healthier diet, get out in the sun, which they tell everybody stay inside, get out in the sun, walk, be active. The more active uh, that you are, the better chance you're going to have to survive. Um, if you're, uh, if you have, uh, if you're around older people, stay away from them, right. you know, separate by age would have been a great thing, not shut everything down. And, um, you would have had people live a lot longer. Um, the problem was they told everybody to stay at home. You know, your cortisol levels raise up. Right. You get more stressed out. You're not really exercising. So when you do get COVID, um, you know, it's it's going to hit you harder. Then you tell people in the hospital, nobody can visit you. Well, I think that killed a lot of people. I think the separation from the family uh, had people lose hope. Correct. And, you know, if, if science doesn't think hope is important, like that tells you where science is. Hope is one of the most important things when people are going through a, right. a life-threatening battle. You right. better have hope. If you don't have hope, you're going to die. Exactly. And 100%. so, you know, that's the the human connection too of it. You know, people laying in a hospital bed by themselves, um, by themselves, dying by themselves. You know, I did a podcast uh, a few months before COVID happened, and I've held people's hands as they're dying at the hospital in Mexico. Uh, I've been I've been experienced a lot of a lot of death. Wow. You know, and you know. I had, uh, we've had a, a few patients that the family wouldn't come see them as they're dying. So they're alone. There's nothing more that we can do. And we want to, like, we, we had people that we wanted to send home, but they felt so much love at the hospital. They asked if they could die in the hospital. And, you know, we have to say, yes, of course, like, if that's what you want, but no family would come see them. 
you know, so I've always been a, like had the fear since seeing what we do in Mexico of dying alone like that. I've seen what that's like and we'll it's... get them around with our nurses and sing them songs and just love on them. But just that the loneliness of your family, not wanting to come to you wow. that's and, and be being by yourself at your last moments. So, and that doesn't happen often, but I've seen it. So I was t- talking about that in the podcast and then with COVID all these people are dying alone without their families. It's not how you're supposed to go, man. You have your family because at that time, you know, at later in life, if if go if things go as you know as they should, let's say, um, you got your family around you. You're not alone. You're telling you know you have family saying, "Don't be scared. You're loved. You know, thank yeah. you for being who you were. All those things are so important. You can make it through this. You're not you know you're you're going to be fine. Right. Words of encouragement, human touch. We did away with all of that. And they acted like it wasn't a big deal, but it was a very big deal. I the the loneliness. Like that. Wow. Yeah. I mean, the loneliness had to kill people. I believe that that's, there's no science that I know of to back that up, but that's common sense. When you separate people uh, from their family and friends, when they're really sick and they're afraid, sometimes they go, you're going to, well, you're going to have a bad, bad uh, outcome. And sometimes all you need is somebody to tell you it's going to be okay. You're, uh, wife or mom or dad or son to hold your hand, you know, wow. and, and we took that away from people and we worshiped science, trust science. The science wasn't being honest with us. They were using that to manipulate people. So, um, yeah, it was a really, it, it was a messed up situation. And I think that we should look back and be as objective as possible and, understand where we made mistakes and be honest that we were manipulated throughout the whole thing. So yeah, I was watching it, reading the data, coming to different conclusions from the data uh, and, you know, arguing or debating people that had no idea. They would just read a headline. <laughs> you know, I got, I got shadow banned on Instagram. They completely cut my reach um, wow. because I was, I got, I got a YouTube video. The first thing I thought when COVID happened, uh, when, when, when the virus was out, was ozone would be a really good treatment for it. And, uh, you know, people know us for stem cells and, um, you know, a lot of other cutting edge treatments. Uh, but I always say ozone is my number one. And, you know, but you can't make any money off of ozone, so right. you can't make it into a drug. I have an ozone generator in my bedroom and in my, my bedroom in uh, Mexico as well. And um, so I started uh, checking different languages uh, and combining with ozone therapy uh, trial. Uh, during COVID. So I did one in Italian. When I got a hit. I'm like, oh, there was a study. And I, this uh, anesthesiologist was running the study at one of the hospitals. And uh, I was like, oh, man, uh, let me reach out to him. So I found his email, sent him an email in Italian, like did the translation. He wrote back in oh, English. Wow. Like, you know, to do, you know, and he responded. And I interviewed him. This is in May of 2020. YouTube took the interview down about a cl- legit clinical trial on ozone oh, for COVID, wow. of which 36 patients, 35 were pre-ICU, uh, one was in the ICU, the 35 that were pre ICU, none of them went to the ICU. The one that was in the ICU got out of the ICU and lived and they took it down. And so, um, you know, it was a, it was a psyop, you know, altogether. Wow. It's very interesting. It was frustrating during, during what was happening, knowing that they were lying to everybody. They money. I think they gave money to everybody to shut them up too. Well, Which yeah. Was good for, for us, but it was. For our business was amazing, but I'm saying a lot of people, a lot of real businesses suffered. Well, what did, what did Pfizer and the pharmaceutical companies first say when uh, they were doing the vaccine? It was going to be free. Yeah. Yeah, they weren't going to make any money off of it. Well, it was free because the government was paying them, you know, and uh, uh, they made record billions. Yeah. Record numbers, <laughs> hundreds of billions. So. And now it's like nothing happened. Lot. Now it's like nothing it's happened. Some people are saying, well, why are you, you should just let it go. Uh, they're telling like people that were, let's call it right most of the time during COVID while yeah. they're like, oh, you know, we, we made mistakes, but you shouldn't, you know, like, well, we should learn from our mistakes. Exactly. Don't do it again. Yeah. So. And make sure it doesn't come out during election year. Yeah. But so you said the watch, the watch, uh, the the watch, watch market was went crazy during COVID. Crazy. It went from zero to a hundred in a day. And all I did was keep on climbing that we got so greedy we weren't selling our merchandise. Because imagine, like, you're in the stock market. The market was just going up and up and up and up and up and up and up. Yeah. The problem is that the crash was so so fast. Yeah, so when did it? When, when did the crash happen? Like, how much did mm-hmm. it go up and then when did the, the crash happen? Went up for a year steady. 
twenty twenty one was like the probably twenty 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 one was the best year in our business for most of the people. Everybody became a watch dealer. Every <laughs> anybody, anybody had a pulse on in, in on New York City was a fucking watch dealer in our <clears throat> community or whatever in our circle, and then. Market was good. You buy a watch for ten thousand. You wear it for a year. You sell it. like the car market. It was one steaming. Now it's crashing. But and then one day, just one day overnight, boom. Everything was like back. To, not even back to normal. It was worse. It was a it was a blood but blood bath. Um, blood bath. Sorry. What'd you do? When Nothing. It happened? Lost money. <laughs> I lost about probably all oh, close to a million bucks. Gotcha. I still have two watches, three watches we own. We own a 5711 Tiffany. I paid, I think we paid 290 If I get 170 I'll be lucky. Gotcha. A 571218 Patek. I paid 155 If I get 85000 I'm lucky. Which one is that? 5712. 5712. It's a, it's a Nautilus. Nautilus. It, okay. It's a thin one with the blue face and a little chronograph inside. Gotcha. Then it had a rose gold dated forty millimeter, green dial. President paid ninety thousand. If I get forty thousand, I'll be lucky. Wow, <laughs> that's what I still have in inventory. Yeah. What we lost on was a Patex worth a fifty nine eighty was three hundred and thirty thousand. Today's a hundred and hundred fifty, hundred sixty thousand. The fifty nine eighty was a uh, rose gold. Uh, rose gold, yeah. Not I love that watch. Yeah. The retail, or I guess the retail from Patek was about one hundred sixty eight thousand. Sixty eight. Now it's a hundred. But when I started gotcha. the business, I remember I used to buy those watches. I couldn't even in two thousand fourteen. I used to buy those watches under retail, under retail, and I couldn't get thousand dollars profit. Yeah. Today it's worth more money, but the biggest watch that took to hit was a sixty five zero one RM. It was a million dollars at its hype. Today it's under three hundred thousand. Really? Wow. Richard Mill sixty five oh one rose gold. A mil my boy paid nine hundred and thirty thousand dollars for that watch. Wow. Today you won't get three hundred thousand. Took a bath. What what do you think's gonna happen? Uh like in the Patek market, for instance, uh, you know, with, with those like that fifty nine eighty that they got up there. Oh yeah, oh. I didn't even see you put that shit up. Wow. That rose gold. That's the watch. You want to hear a funny story about that watch? So that watch, I used to buy and put my name on the papers. And I used to sell them for a thousand profit back then. One guy on Instagram the other day, literally saw like I blew up. He hits me up. I have a surprise for you. So what is it? I have a watch you might like. He sends me this watch. I said, all right, fuck it. There's a thousand of them. He's like, yeah. But he sends me a picture of the papers. My name was on the papers. <laughs> I said, how much you want for the watch? <laughs> I want it. Like, I paid you 70000 I want 160 I said, how about you fucking look at my name every day of your life and say it was my watch before yours? <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy the watch, brother. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's funny. I ain't fucking paying over Mark because I had my name on a big <clears throat> fucking deal. Yeah. But I, that's, I used to get those for 60 I couldn't I couldn't sell them for 68000 back in the day. I used to buy them for 65 66 Man, yeah, that's a beautiful watch. Yeah, that peak was 330000 I like the go. Is there a, is there a uh, champagne dial on no. that one? No, they no, don't no, make no, that. No, 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 no. I don't think Patek makes anything champagne. -y. No, a Nautilus. They usually blue, white, blue, white, gray colors that stand out more. I think than champagne. Because listen, if you put a champagne dial in there, yeah, it's not the dial's not going to pop. Yeah, right. It's going to be the same. What's that word called? Subtle. Well, it looks the same. Yeah, there's a pop. I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't, my English is horrible. It's fine. So that's it. The blue dial, I used to buy those watches for 30 grand. Wow. They reached 200. Now they're trading about 75,000. What about the uh, the Aquanaut with the uh, rose gold? Which one? Um, with the rubber yeah. band. That thing, you know, retail was 42 just about a year ago. And now it's 63. 51, even 63,000 you should buy. You can sell that oh, watch for 90 grand. I can't. Well, yeah, I can't. You can't buy them retail. I, I, you know, but it, you could if you build a relationship with an AD. You could buy them in retail. Really? But like, I'm banned from every. That's one. That fifty one sixty four. Yeah, that's a beautiful watch. Yeah. You want to see a nice one? Put fifty nine sixty eight A. Fifty nine sixty eight A. No, take the rose gold out. You see? Oh, right there. You see the orange one? Right there. You see that orange one? Yeah. That watch is steel. 
All right. 42,000 retail. They trade for 120 grand. Whoa. Yeah, that's wild. So you, you, the rose gold, you can buy less than that piece of shit. Excuse my language. Why? Because it has an orange strap. That's the only difference. The orange strap and the orange hands inside. You see that? Yeah. Clear, uh, yeah. I'd rather buy that one, honestly, the one you like. You can buy that today for 100 100 the rose gold. Yeah. But they won't buy it. They want that one. Yeah. I like the rose Bro, gold. Oh, it's steel. Literally nothing there. But yeah. you know what? It's a demand. Yeah. For example, a demand. you blow, right? A you yeah. blow watch, you can buy a beautiful watch for 12000 Yeah. Under retail, 50 off. Nobody wants no demand. Yeah, they've There's gone no down. There's no fucking demand. There's no demand for a you blow. Nobody yeah. wants it. I believe for the best bank for your buck is a you blow. It's a good looking watch. Sexy watch. Yeah. Nobody wants it. Nobody. What do you think about like for collectors? Um, or let's say I was wanting to buy a few watches a year that keep their value. Mm. What would you tell? What Protect. would you tell me to do? Aquanauts, Nautiluses. So even the market now is a little bit taking a turn down, you know, going down a little bit. Protects are still holding for some odd reason. Yeah. That's the only market. RM took the biggest hit and uh, Rolex took. So now Rolex gold watches don't trade over retail anymore like they used to. Mm. So if you're going to, if the Rolex is going to call you for a gold watch for retail, don't buy it. I can sell it to you for under retail. You understand? Yeah. But if a Submariner, a Pepsi, a Sprite, a, a Batman, those are always going to be over. Daytonas. I used to walk to AD, they used to sell me Submariners for 35% off. And beg me to buy it. Today I'm banned from every dealer in the country. <laughs> Why? Well, just because you sell them? Yeah, because I'm a reseller. I but mean. They yeah. see it. They Google your name. They see what happens. And they just tell you, it's not for you. You're, you're gone. You can't buy anything. See that watch? That white gold Submariner with the blue dial. See the blue dial? No, that's a two-tone. The bottom. It's white. All white with a blue dial. There we go. Well, that's a diamond dial in there. That watch is on the retail by ten grand. Right now. Yeah. So what's what's retail? On this watch? Yeah. Uh hold on. I think forty forty two thousand. And you can get it for thirty two? I sell them for thirty two. Nice. Brand new. Nice. But it's a white goal. So white goal is for people who usually Wall Street, these guys don't want to flash. They wear white gold because it's heavy. But if you know, you know, like a Porsche, you know? Mm -hmm. Drive a Porsche. It's, it's, it's like a Lamborghini, but it's a Porsche. So you know, it's a Turbo S, you know. If it's a Carrera, you know, it's, you know, you know the difference. The gold ones as well. I sold a gold one yesterday, the same one, yellow gold for 34.5. Retail is the same thing. <clears throat> yeah, if you look historically uh, on Rolexes, I was actually like kind of digging in, seeing how they've appreciated over the years. Oh, yeah. Um, Submariners. Uh, red subs Daytonas appreciate it like crazy so yeah I mean if, let's say that you wanted to buy a couple a, a year Daytona let's say the average person probably has well it's just an average person but let's say somebody has 15 to 20 to thousand invest yes it's one watch one watch which which what, what would they pick to put in the safe oh to put in the safe so Daytona's the ceramic ones are over thirty thousand dollars today. Like the white dial, just makes no sense. Double retail, but fifty to twenty thousand to put in the safe. Uh, either a Pepsi, a Batman, uh, Submariner is a classic. Black sub. The Red Sea Dwellers are nice. Red Sea Dweller. Right, one two six six zero zero. Can Pull you that put one that in? More. One two. One two six six zero zero red, I think, or one two six 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 zero. So start six. Yeah, you see right there. Did I get it right? Yeah. Oh, shit. Not that one. That's an aftermarket bezel. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that's nice. Our Red Submariner now, from the 60s, 70s, are worth fucking like 20 grand. Really? Yeah, what, a couple of hundred dollars back then. You have Daytonas, steel Daytonas, over 100 grand. Man. Six two six three, six two six five. All those references. Yeah, that's the red. That's a red. That's a red sub. You see that one? Yeah. 
The old looking one. Yeah. That one, the one right next to, to the, right. the right. Yeah. That. See? It has red lettering. The market is crazy on it. Today. And you can get one. Yeah, but it's old, bro. Like old. Oh, that one's the old one. That's yeah, the old one. The seat dweller I can get for under retail. The red dial. So let's say it's, no, it's not it's probably retail. Twelve five is retail plus tax. That's what you're gonna pay. Um, if someone is going through, uh, if someone's coming to you, yeah, uh, or actually not necessarily coming to you. Let's say they're they're going to look for a watch. Yeah. What questions should they ask? I never thought of that. What questions should they ask? What questions should you ask if you buy a watch? I think usually people who come, they know the answers. I see. Right? They do their research before. So you can smell somebody who's going to buy or who's going to window shop you or who's going to waste your time. So... Like back there, we're very cruel. If you watch some of my videos, I'll throw people out. I'll curse at them, tell them get out, or they'll window shop and I'll blow them up. That he's when a guy came with an AP. I remember, and he, I was trying to steal it from him. I offered him ten thousand under cost. I offered him five thousand under asking. I gave him asking, and he still said, "I'll let you know." And I say, "You know what? You're a window shopper. Sure. Yeah. Get the fuck out of here." <laughs> and I blew him up, and then uh, my TikTok people were commenting, "Oh, he has every right to." I said, "Bro, if I'm sitting there, I'm a if you know if you want to sell your watch." You want to, if you want to price me out, it's not a famous quote, which I always tell everybody. I don't come to your store and ask you how much is this, right? Like, how much would you pay? You know how much you're going to pay for something, right? Mm -hmm. A guy comes to me and says, How much do you pay for my watch? I'm never going to give him an answer. So I always tell him, It's your watch, your price, right? Because you don't negotiate against yourself. Mm. Let's say I want to sell this to you for a dollar fifty because I don't know the market, but you're going to, but, um, it's worth five bucks. Mm -hmm. so you get, as a good person, you can offer four bucks, but I really, I want a dollar fifty. So now I'm getting more money than I want. So I'll let you build, like, tell me what you want. If it's too high, I'll say it's not for me. If we're close, I'll negotiate. If it's too low, I'll still try to negotiate because I'm a fucking Jew, and then we'll see from there, <laughs> right? But um, mostly I always say it's your watch, your price. I'm never going to give an offer. If you come in, how much you pay for this watch? I say, get out. Never. This. You don't go, I don't negotiate against myself. That's my, my motto always. I tell everybody, never negotiate against yourself. Never. Or if I give you a watch and you say, how much? You ask me, how much is this Patek? I tell you, it's 130000 What are you going to ask me? What's the next question you're going to ask me? Um, What's the best price? Yeah, I'm not going to tell you what the best price is. I already gave you my price. What's your price? That's what yeah. I would ask you. What are you willing to pay for it? I'm going to go down and down and down until you say, okay, that's, I'm shooting myself <clears> in the leg. Right, so my answer is, what would you pay? You say I'll pay one twenty-five. Yeah, there you go. And I'm like, you know what? Let's flip for it. I'll say, let's say, let's flip five thousand here, five thousand there. <laughs> or if you don't want to, I feel like I'm out of luck. We'll come to middle ground. But I'll never ever, what's it called? Um, negotiating against myself. Like this stuff, I teach the young kids also. People get excited. Oh, first of all, if the wash is cheap. Don't show you're excited. You gotta have poker face. That comes in, you know, a guy walks into my store and watch well, for 10 grand and tell me eight. But my salesman goes, oh my God, that's oh, Danny, relax. <laughs> 8,000, I said, ah, can you do seven? No, you know, it's worth eight, I can sell for 10. I know he knows already and I'll give him the eight, right? But if you show excitement, the guy right away shows, doesn't want to sell it. He feels like he's, you know, certain things you got to, I try to teach him. But rule number one is your watch, your price. Never, never, if somebody comes in and asks me how much I would pay, I would say not for me. Never. I don't know how it works in your business or whatever, but by us, yeah, it's it's just, it's just different in, in my business. That's that, that's good. So somebody comes in, they should know what they want to sell their watch exactly. for, and that's a starting point of the negotiation. Exactly. You, let me ask you a question. You go into a car dealer. You know what car? Like ninety percent of people know what car they want. Yeah. And how much they're willing to pay for it. Yeah. Right. And then you start negotiating. That's what I think is the same way by us. People get insulted. People, and also I'm very. I'm very different than everybody else. If you walk into me and I'm eating lunch, I'll still eat. I'm not going to stop. Like, hey, because I'm, I'm more, it's, for, it's New York City. We don't give a shit. Come on. No, like, I have people who get insulted. Oh, you're not giving me the proper attention. I said, bro, if you wanted a white glove service, go to the fucking, like, you know, here it's homie. Come <laughs> sit with me, eat lunch, we'll talk and whatever, you know. 
Yeah. If you see on the day bash me on social media, you have no, I'll slap you. You're eating. If you, if I walked in, you're eating lunch while I'm talking to you. I said, bro, I can't even eat for five minutes. Yeah. So I'll just eat and negotiate while I'm eating. A lot of people find that offensive, which is fine. Whatever. But I don't care. But it is what it is. I need to eat too. It's you so know? much better to, to, to do business. In my opinion, um, with people that you, you know, that you can get along with. Yeah. You know, we tell people to, we actually do tell people to, uh, they're not the right customer for us all the time. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things. If, if they don't like it, man, it's like, we want to do business with people we like. We no, really like, do. Sometimes it's better to say no, if you can't do it, say yes, yes, yes. Then you can't do it. Then you look like an idiot. Yeah. So no, I'm sorry. I can't do it. Oh, you'll lose 5,000, but it's okay. You, your name is like still there. Like you, a guy comes Polishes. I have a service center with polishing and, and, and service, right? So some watches need polishing. Some older watches need service. Parts, watch stops running on time, right? It's 10 minutes fast, 10 minutes slow, right? The watch needs a repair. So I have a service center upstairs where we service all these watches. Sometimes I tell my people, just don't take the job. Don't say yes tomorrow and then they come tomorrow and it's not ready. Mm -hmm. You don't look good. Yeah. Say, no, I'm sorry, I can't do it. Well, I'll be able to pay 400 Pay me 1000 I'm not going to do it. I can't. <laughs> right. I don't have time. You know? So yeah. it's better to let them walk and say yes. Yeah. And they're not gonna be anything. It's like yelling at you and it's gonna cause all this stress and whatever the hell it is for no reason. Yeah. So a lot of jobs we we sometimes we just turn down. Not to be mean, like you said, sometimes it's not for you. Yeah, right? we, we had somebody uh yesterday actually down in uh down in, in TJ. Uh Monday's MRI day. Now we don't have MRI, so we have to send them off. And we do more MRIs than I mean it's like about a hundred a week. Do you want to open one so, by you? What's up? You don't want to open one in your hospital? We can't. We're trying to buy the land behind to do it, but we're, we don't have any more space. I oh, mean, wow. uh, yeah, we just got a new CT, but yeah, we want we want to buy two MRIs, but there is no space. Um, so we're trying to negotiate with the with the restaurant next door to sell us their, their land. But um, so uh, we told the, the, the um, customer, it's generally between two and $300, uh, depending on, what part of the body and we don't make any money on it. This is, you know, we'll take you there. We'll set up, set up the appointment, but <clears throat> you know, this is uh, between you and them. Well, it was $340. There was a fluctuation in the, in the peso, which we have, you know, nothing uh -huh. to do with. Right. And first thing they, they got on online and there's like blasting us. This is a, you know, first day that they're there. And it's like, they lied to me. Like I, yeah, you know, like I give a shit about forty bucks. Like, yeah. are you kidding me? Like, I you, let me just pay the whole thing for you, just to you know, if you think that's we're trying off. to screw yeah. you, please. And uh, so uh, Scott, Scotty went to him. He's my my business partner, and he said, "We will give you a full refund, like of everything right now, uh, and you can go if you think that we're just trying to take advantage of our forty dollars." Um, wow. You know, like this is ridiculous. Some people, man. Um, and you know, they're like, "Well, because you know, they're I think." There was two of them. They paid about sixty thousand dollars, so we write them a sixty thousand dollars check, and they can go home. Um, uh, that's how that's how we feel about that's it. How you build credibility. Right? Yeah, like, you don't have to put your money where your mouth is. Yeah, like please. So Did they uh, stay similar. Yeah, they stayed. Uh, I think one of the people got a little offended, but that's it's we, fine. We, we it's, it's it's fine. Truth hurts sometimes. Okay. Yeah, like we're not catch it up and move on. <laughs> right to think that we would ruin our reputation for forty bucks. Yeah, come on. Like some people listen. We deal with this every day. Every day, people come in, window shoppers or whatever. Oh, the best story is the best people are the ones who come in and say, how much for this watch? Tell them price. We want to buy mine? I tell them, get the fuck out of here. Don't ever, if you want to come in and say, yo, I want to sell this watch. How much? Like, I want X amount of money. Don't yeah. fish me and ask me how much for this watch on the window and then try to sell me yours. You know, I hate that right. shit. Right away, I throw them out. Right away, with no hesitation. Like, you get the fuck out of here. Oh, you're so rude. It's fine. Get over it. Go to somebody else. Yeah, you know, just be straight, man. Just say I have this watch. I want X amount. You're willing to pay? Yes or no? I mean, negotiate. You come in this way. Oh, how much for this watch? Let me try it on. Well, I have one in my bag. How much would you pay? That's what, that makes me crazy. Yeah, <laughs> certain things that just make me crazy over there. Yeah, no, I mean it's it's how it is. It's how it is. I'm not like you. Yeah, I'm not calm. I have a very short temper. Oh yeah, very short. Over there, you have to. It's a bunch of sharks on 47th Street. A bunch of sharks. A bunch. So if you're going to, you know when you go to prison, they tell you beat the f biggest fucking dude in prison. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not to be, that's 47 issue, man. You got to go in and be as tough as you can. We don't fight there. I mean, I can't fight for shit, so I don't, I don't swing my hands, but I try to be the loudest or the most aggressive one there. So they know, you know? Yeah. Like, you can't like 
step on me or whatever because you have to demand the respect there. Is that is that the little watch district there? It's the whole yeah, it's a watch jewelry and diamond district. Yeah, you used to do diamonds as well, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Many years I did diamonds. So my trick was uh before GIA opened, GIA is a laboratory that would grade the diamonds. In, in I used to go to India before Hong Kong every month. India to Mumbai. We would go to uh to India. They didn't have GIA labs, so they would have stones. Let's say you're a geologist, you would quote it, you would write G color. I saw F color. So there's a list price, right? Between color, clarity. Color, clarity. Let's say you do G color, VS2 is 20,000 per carat. I'm off, way off. But for example, if it's F color, VS2 is 28,000 per carat. So I saw F color. Mm. The geologist saw G color. But there's an $8,000 difference per carat if I'm right. If I'm wrong, I'm fucked. Basically, that's how we gambled. Mm -hmm. I go to India, find these big stones. The bigger the the bigger the stone, the more profit you made if you got the right color. Yeah. And then come home to GIA, to New York, submit it to GIA in New York. GIA is Ge Geological Institute of America. Basically, they're a, one of the biggest nonprofit like Rolex. Um, they certify the stone, the color clarity. It's natural. It's not you know. It's not fake. Whatever. Mm -hmm. And they would give me F color. So I'll make like 20000 a stone then, just an upgrade, and then sell the stone for a profit, make more money. Oh, nice. But if you miss, you're fucked. You lose, you lose, you lose 10 grand. Wow. So it's a hit or miss. I did that for about two years till India found out what we're doing. They opened GIA over there. So we uh, got fucked. So I said, listen, I'm going back. Like, so I said, I'm going to go back to full-time watches now. I got you. Because those days were over where we used to party and then make money out just, just from risking you know, no, because how it works in GIA, I believe, is that's a gemologist, and they believe this is G color, and that's what they'll grade it or F color. So that's the way we risked it then. Interesting. The last, I last, my last trip in India was December of 2015. I never went afterwards. How, how did you like India? Well, it was nice. I'm saying, the smell was horrible, <laughs> but the street food was amazing. You have to have a strong stomach. You eat that food, you can fucking die if you not if you don't have a strong like, yeah. Um India was nice. People are very nice. Nice. V Indian people are respectful, nice. The culture is nice. It's it's just very I don't know about now, then it was very like it was like it was dirty. It wasn't taken care of. That country wasn't taken care of. Yeah, sure. Poverty was Either you're very rich or you're very poor. Yeah, I saw kids eating from the garbage truck. Wow, that was, was killed me. Like, and you can't even pull out money there. Cause if you pull out money to give them, they're gonna f like swarm you. They're gonna swarm. Like yeah. you put a piece of bread and all the birds come. Yeah, man, it's amazing how you know we live over here in America, and I hear people complaining and stuff. I'm like, come on, come man. on, come on. Yeah, this is. We have it really, really good Amazing here. Amazing here. And, uh, Amazing my, here. My girlfriend was just actually in uh, Egypt last week. She was there for like, uh, she was in Turkey and then uh, Egypt the last three weeks. Oh, wow. And she was talking about the poverty in Egypt. She was just, uh, she was very grateful looking at it. Like, um, oh, yeah. you know, there's a lot of poverty and people are still very happy, you know, which is, you know, obviously money doesn't make happiness, but, you know. They don't know better. Right. A poor man is no better than a rich man, right? Yeah. And so, but when I hear people complain in America, I'm like, what are you complaining about? Like, this is, we have a lot of Paradise. opportunity. Well, and you know that, uh, and I, I don't know where I read this, but I, I read that uh, someone who um, was an, Im uh, an immigrant uh, that moved here is three times more likely to be a millionaire than someone that was born here. Correct. You know. 100% it's true. Look at all the, like today, like even these NBA athletes, they came from poverty. Yeah. It wasn't handed to them. Look at Michael Jordan's son cannot be an NBA player. Why not? The most talented NBA player in the, in the world. These guys from Africa or whatever, these players, they because they're poor, they they want it. Yeah. Americans, we became unfortunately we became lazy. Hey, yeah, no, it's uh, yeah, the American dream is real. It's real. And, you know, if you and what do you think about this right now? You know, Dedrick and I were talking about it. That's my other business partner, and then we heard Dana White say it exactly what Dedrick had said, but that it's never been easier to be successful than today. Yeah, today. If you're a man. And you have that kind of yeah. drive, uh, you know, using that, you know, testosterone type masculinity. Yeah. Uh, it's you pretty know easy. Him, you know what I told my son? Don't be a basketball player. Be the owner of the fucking team. Love it. That's what you should do. Anybody can be a ball player. You're, you're, 
you're a pawn to them. I want you to own the team, manage the team, be a general manager. Use your brain. We're not talented. Jews are not basketball players. We're not talented. I told him, I want to go BNBL. I said, you, you can't. We're not talented, gifted. We're not 6'5", 300 pounds. We're not. We're puny little kids, right? So what are you going to do? Use your fucking brain. Your talent is your brain. Use your brain. Go figure out how you're going to own this fucking team. How you're going to pay the salaries to everybody. That's what you should, that's what you should strive for. Yeah. So it's okay if we're not, I'm not going to go outside and say, oh my God, I'll, I have, it's, there's not enough people in my, for my background or basketball players. Because we suck, bro. That's why we suck. <laughs> we do. Jews are not athletic. Who? Who's one Jewish NBA player? Zero. <laughs> there's not. There's not. Maybe three owners though. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Nick Harris over the Heat. Mark Cuban. No, Mark yeah. Cuban is a Jew, right? Yep. Holocaust survivor. His parents. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, we have Robert Kraft, one okay. of the Patriots. Who else? I know a lot of them. I mean, I lot. Of, oh, that guy uh, from the seventy six is Michael Rubin. I'm sure, there's plenty more. I'm saying. That's why I teach my kids. Like, try to. Bigger than what you look at on TV. Be yeah. the guy behind the scenes. Yeah. You know? That's what I believe, that's what I think is the, like, you know, people think our business is all so green and it's, we make so much money. I'd rather be like people who are high tech, who make stupid money sitting at home, YouTubers who make crazy money. Yeah. Mr. Beast and these guys who do nothing but give back and, Make videos out of it. I love what he does giving back, man. Did you see what he did in Africa with the, the uh, water? He came to 47th. Yeah, he's the one who really put water there. That's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, he came to 47th with a credit card. And he went to my boy Richie's <laughs> store. And he said, uh, Richie's store, uh, Leon Diamonds. He went there. And he went to the guys. Like, you have two credit cards. One has 70, whatever. And whatever you, tr you pick something in the store and swipe it. If it goes through, it's yours. One guy swiped like a fifty thousand dollar, four thousand dollar object he won. One guy swapped ninety thousand and declined. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody knew how much was on there, yeah. but it was oh that's funny. And he gave it away. That's awesome. Guy's a fucking genius. Yeah. No, he seems like a a good dude. I mean I already, I already make stupid money also. Yeah, he's okay, a multi billionaire. I saw an interview with him and he's a multi multi billionaire. He said he wouldn't I think I it was, he was in the one ten of billion range. Guys in school who wasn't popular. Probably not. Who cares, though? You know, I think th th there's a lot of a lot of that, like, and, and kids that are growing up that maybe not popular. That's the best thing for them. It's, it is, man. It That's gives you the, the burn. I wasn't popular when I was growing up, but it gave me the burn in my belly to do what I wanted to be where I'm not aware where I want to become, but yeah. it gives me this motivation every day to show that I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it. Right? Whoever's there already at school, he thinks he's all privileged. He doesn't give a fuck. He doesn't want to work. Yeah, I'm the shit. I'm this. I'm that, right? Right. Yeah, for me, man, my, my parents, you know, weren't wealthy at all. My dad had an accident when I was four, and he shattered his hip, oh, wow. and they didn't have any, uh, um, we lost, like, lost the house. Or, Army take care of it? What's that? The Navy, I mean, the, Oh, no, this is after he, this is well after he was out. But they out. don't take care of you after you discharge? Uh, not really. I mean, he was just, he, he, he did his, his, uh, his time in the military, and, you know, I think he was out within four years. It was pretty quick. Yeah, he gets healthcare through them, but the VA healthcare yeah. system's not very good. Right. But at the time, he was, you know, he was a court reporter, and he shattered his hip, so he's self-employed. So, you know, family didn't have any way to make money, um, and so uh, he was out of work for about six months. And I remember, like, growing up, and they made their way out. Like, my dad uh, flipped a house when I was fifteen, and then they got it rolling again. You know, they, they, he he hustled, and my mom she worked for American Airlines uh, for the insurance, basically. <clears throat> so we had insurance, but I always remember like. You know, shoes were a big thing back in the day, and my parents didn't have the money to buy me nice shoes. You know, and it sounds kind of funny, like it because it really doesn't matter, big picture. Right. But when I when you're a kid, you, you know, I always school, wanted everybody those has the Nikes and you don't, right? I had the the Walmart ones. They gave you the sh and it, it burned just, your fucking belly, right? It did, man. I wanted yeah. nice clothes and nice shoes, and you know, I never wanted to. Uh, I saw all the the stresses that my parents had were more monetary stresses. And yeah, they're great people. They're still married 50, uh, 51 years. Wow. And I, I never wanted to have that stress like that in life where when I have a wife one day and my kids, uh, you know, they see that and not that my parents did anything wrong. I just knew how much it stressed them out. 
Right. And I was like, I never want to do right. that, you right. know? And I had big money stresses. I mean, I've been, like I was telling you earlier, I've probably almost been bankrupt, you know, I don't know, five times over the last 10 years, Whoa. maybe 10 times. I don't know how many, but it's, we've, we've self-funded everything, never taken an outside investor. So it's just That's not amazing. easy to do in healthcare, <laughs> but uh, I don't want to be influenced by, uh, by another investor that yeah. tries to tell us what to they do. Tell you what to do. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the stresses over money are more, they're bigger and I'm, you know, personally, I'm pretty good, you know? So it's yeah, like, if I had sure. a family, you know, I have enough set, set aside where, uh, you know, we'd be yeah. okay. But, but um, again, the ki the kids got to know that you don't have it because then they become comfortable and then they don't want to work hard. Yeah. So what happened was my father, we grew up with a lot of money mm -hmm. and we were spoiled. But then when my father lost the money, I had no choice and I had no money. Then that's what made me get a job or whatever. Cause I don't know. I don't know. I but you figured that, it out. I mean, well, that's the thing, man. How'd like, you figure it out? I said, you figured it out though. Oh, you you figured to. out what to do. You got to throw somebody on the street to figure it out. Well, uh, yeah, but a lot of people don't. And I think they're trained to think. They have self pity. Yeah. Self pity. That's right. You can't have self pity. No. Cause then you're just going to eat yourself and eat yourself. And you know, my niece passed away. Um, my brother, his whole life, my brother lost his oldest. She mm. was 18 from leukemia. You know, and every, my brother told me the first month it was so hard for me. I was questioning, but I say, no, why am I going to self-pity myself? My job now is to go help the people who lost their children mm -hmm. to cope with it. And that's yeah. his whole goal in life. All he does now is goes to parents who lost their children and explain to them why it's the most beautiful thing ever that can happen. And wow. that's what God wanted because I have to be a believer. Mm -hmm. God, it's, no, it's not your soul. God gave me the soul. He lent it to you so he can decide whenever he wants to take it. Mm. Right, and that's what he does. And he said it gave me purpose. He's happy, and he's having. He had three more children once she died. Wow! So they're orthodox. They have kids every year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow! They don't stop. They just there's no TV. Just, so we cannot have uh, we cannot have sex unless we has to have just to have children. Oh, that's a pleasure. Today there's leniencies, but <clears throat> we can't wear condoms. A woman who takes birth control cannot tell her man. Because we cannot waste our seed. Our seed is only to have children. Wow. So you cannot finish only inside of her. Who, who made that rule? The, the, the Torah. Does it say that? Yeah. The first commandment in, this, in the Torah is to multiply, to have children. That's but, the first commandment. But it doesn't say to... But then the rabbis made a whole thing that... Yeah, yeah I'm saying the Torah doesn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's not the Torah. That's an interpretation, right? I'm, I'm going to say interpretation. Yeah. I'm sorry. You're yeah. right. The Torah doesn't say, listen, you have to finish inside of her or you're fucked. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> the rabbi said that if you, the whole purpose of when it's said to to have children, it means that you can only finish inside of her. So we can't choose a lot of, you know, when they're married, they're not allowed to have condoms or whatever. So my brother has, thank God, he, had, uh, he just had a baby last week. Number 11. Is this your, uh, my your older twin? brother? Oh. Have, well, I'm one of six. We're a big family. Okay. One of six. So my sister's 47. She has four grandkids already. Wow. She got married at 18. So we, they get married young by us. 18, 17, 18, they get married. My other sis, my brother is, Asaf is 44, 40, 1979, 44. My sister, Julia, not is 42, 41, 42. I'm 37. My twin is 37. I have a baby sister who's 30. Yeah. And we have like 25 or 26 nieces wow. and nephews. My brother's wife has over a hundred nieces and nephews. Their wow. family of twelve. Each one has ten plus kids. That's how it goes. Yeah. Just have children. You don't have TV at home. What are you gonna do? <laughs> yeah, you're not gonna do. I love lot. watching TV. I watch sports and I watch Family Guy. That's my two like things I do, <laughs> or documentaries. I watch a lot of documentaries. Yeah. Um, I didn't watch TV till I, I didn't know what it like when I went to Disney first time in my life. I was a father and I was like, what the. F fuck is this I don't know any of the characters can you imagine you go to Disney you're an adult you don't know any of the characters I, I don't know many of them <laughs> Same, I'm sure you grew up watching cartoons oh yeah I know Mickey Mouse yeah I don't know Minnie Mouse. who did I see that I was in awe of uh, Matilda or I don't, I don't even know what the hell they are anymore uh, Snow White bro I don't know whatever <laughs> it is but my kids were teaching me about yeah this stuff because we, we didn't grow up with it till today my father won't come to my house because I have a TV Really? Yeah, you won't come. Wow. My parents don't have one, don't want one, don't want to hear of one. Right. Man. 
That's got to be tough. I mean, it's it's like you want to see your dad. I see him. I go to his house. Oh, you go over there. Gotcha. Like I said, I sat with him. We were at a bar mitzvah, and I sat with him, and he was asking me, no. I'm like, because uh, I, I barely see them. It's my fault. But he's like, no, how you doing? That's good. And he's like, what's going to be? What's going to be? When are you going to come back? And I said, dad, I never left. Huh. That's good. I never left. But maybe in your people think, oh, I never left. I still believe in God. I still pray to God. Just because I don't have a... I told him the, the, the curls went from here to here. It's the same shit, right? <laughs> There's no difference. <laughs> what, is, what does he think of your hair? Oh, he, he, I, I don't think I ever showed it to him. No, no I, put a keep, I put a yarmulke when I see him. The oh. Jewish thing you wear, the yarmulke. So I, I put it on my head. I don't show it to him. Never. Never. He, he knows. He sees it. So he asked me a question the other day. He's like, you know, what's the, why do people follow you so much? Like, why you... I said, Dad, you're, you're a community leader, right? You're a master salesman at what you do, right? You preach people about religion, about God, and they follow you. I got that from you. I do the same thing with the watches, with my social media. He's like, no, but I... He was like in awe how people like follow and, and go after like what people because he believes people have nothing better to do with their life I said but dad this is what life is people like luxury items right people love <clears throat> watches people love cars what do men have we have watches and cars that's all we have we want to have handbags makeup dresses earrings rings necklaces engagement rings we have nothing we're providers we want to spoil ourselves because no one is buying us a, a watch or a car so we buy ourselves a watch <laughs> And a car, it's our, that's all a man has to him. Yeah. Right? That's true. That's, that's, that's a good point. I mean, it, yeah, you think about, like, my girlfriend, I probably bought her, I don't know, bunch of five or six purses this year. There you go. You know, and um, you get one watch. It's not a bad For thing. yourself, and you have to ask your permission. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. No. But that's how, that's how, how it probably used to be, but not, not, not this girlfriend. No, um, it's better. You don't, you know, I don't believe a man should ask his, as long as she's not missing anything, oh, I believe no. you're entitled to whatever the hell you want with your money, right? If she has bread on her, she oh, has she's roof over her. Well taking, she doesn't tell. She's really I cool. I had a guy come to me, bro. Really I'm cool. telling you, it was two weeks ago, emailing me. I don't give my phone number to nobody. Mm -hmm. They just blow me up all day. My phone's blown up all day. I don't want to hear it. I give it to my assistant, Josh, or my workers, or my partner. And then he emails me, because I have my email on, on, on Instagram. I want to buy two uh, Van Cleve bracelets, these bracelets. Oh, no problem. I'm coming to my wife. He makes a deal with me. Mazal, no problem. He says, add links, add gold. I said, gold is another $200 stat. I'll pay for it, no problem. He leaves. I go add the gold. He sends me an email. My wife doesn't give me permission to buy the fucking bracelets. <laughs> wow. Where does the world come to? Yeah, right. That she's wearing herself the Van Cleef bracelets. Why can't you? Why do you have to ask her permission? Yeah, it's weird. I felt. I, I asked him. I said, "Listen, but when you grow up, when you grow, I reply when you grow a pair of nuts. Please come back. Thank you. <laughs> You're yeah. LOL, and that's it. <laughs> no, man. I mean, it's it's like uh, like come on. We no. provide for a woman. Absolutely. I'm saying you can ask her her opinion and say, listen, why you run it, but you know, to ask her permission, like she asks you permission, she goes buys a purse, like you know, she'd thank you. No, I mean, like my situation is, I mean, she's we've been together about a year, and um, it's the like first. You know, woman and that I've I'm like I, I'm probably gonna marry her one day. Good. And uh, you know, but she doesn't want for anything, man. And she's I you know she, she she's super laid back. That's and when cool. you want to do it for her. She goes, oh, I'm happy. Like no, but that's when you want to buy her something because she doesn't want it. Right. If a woman tells you I want it, you automatically say no because <laughs> she's gold digger or whatever. If yeah. she says I don't want, it, I don't want it. You're like fuck, I gotta do this for her. even though she doesn't want it because how do men show love? We we, we provide. Oh yeah, she's yeah. I, right. I mean, I got my work and then I got. Yeah. Making, I want to make her happy. Exactly, <laughs> that's how my brain works. Like, exactly, work, make her happy. Exactly, you know. And uh, no, I, I like it though. But I, I was looking at all the bags up, but I'm like, I need to get, you know, I need to get uh, on the watch game. And Scotty, who you'll meet, my business partner, uh, he's got an AP uh, Royal Oak, Royal Oak uh, stainless, I believe. Could be white gold. I'm not. Uh, I'll tell if I'm, if I see the watch. I'll yeah, tell, I'll tell you what it is. But um. Yeah, he's a, he's a he's a huge watch a fan. A lot of people are. So, um, and then I started getting, you know, started looking into it. I'm like, you know what? All he says, I got this Breitling Scotty and Dedrick actually bought for me probably three years so ago. I've never bought myself a watch. Actually, you I, should. 
Yeah, and I'm, I'm going. I'm, I'm thinking about doing a, a couple a year, you know, just to it's I like want to collect. Car. Start with one, mm-hmm. see how it like it, see how it feels, you know, and you move on. You just buy ten at a time, <laughs> buy one. <laughs> yeah, see it goes well. You buy another one, whatever you like. Right, each one has their own preference. And you budget yourself. Which, well, what, what do you want? Like, I have guys who come twice a year buy a watch for me. I have a guy who comes every other week. But he's just like, oh, my friend bought it off me. Or my brother, I gave it to my brother. I did this. I have this, you know. Because some people believe, like, money is nothing today. You'd rather have commodity. Something mm-hmm. happens, God forbid, or something. At least, you know, <clears throat> money you're going to spend. Some people have money in their account. They don't know what to do with it. All right? They're so liquid. They don't need it. They just rather buy Merch like they buy gold or watches, they throw in the safe when they ever need the money, they'll sell it again. Just not to spend the money, right? Yeah. To save their money that way. You know? No, for sure. That's my thought too. I'm like, you know, long term it'd be good to uh keep them in the safe and have you it's know, only good and, to keep and, so you buy them to wear them. You don't buy them to invest, right? Because that money that you're holding, it's gonna mm-hmm. go up ten grand in ten years. You can make that money a thousand times in a year if you invest that money. If you invest yeah. fifteen thousand dollars, I'm sure you would make in one year you'll yeah. triple it. Yeah, it's more like diversification. Different. You know. That's different though. But if that's like your main like priority, oh, then well, don't do it. Not, definitely not. All right. That's my advice to you. <clears> and I would, I would say keep them in the safe. I'll still like my my thought is have like a daily. I buy and one then, for your kids. Yes, that's what I did. Yeah, I bought one for him for her, and I left it in the safe. And I said when they get older, they want it. They don't want it. I'll wear it. Whatever. <laughs> it just I bought it ten years ago, before I even had it. You know. So that's awesome. That's what I do. That's also that's all that's all we do, right? We we worry about the future too. But I didn't buy it to invest and throw it away because bro, the market is so Yeah. yeah it's such a Mishka bubble. You don't know like it's not real estate. Yeah. I mean it's it became like it, but it's real estate tomorrow. Somebody's gonna live in there regardless. Yeah, what about like a the the female watch market? I don't I don't hear much about about it like um do they kind of hold value as, as well? Yeah, as? same thing. It's just a brand. It's not really the watch as long as the brand. So if a, if a woman wanted to buy, let's say, something between, I'm going to give a wider range here, 15 to 30. No, oh, it's a big range. You buy an AP 37 millimeter Royal Oak. You can buy a, ro- a, a 31 millimeter President Yellow Gold or Rose Gold. Um, that's my two favorites for a woman. But status, you buy an AP. AP. That's a girl, you know, they want to buy an Audemars. 15, 4, 5. 15, 4, 5, 1. ST. Ah, right there, you see? With the diamond. Which the one? Bezel. Right? You see that one? The, the, not the blue. There's blue. There's black. All of them. They're all the same model. I like it's, that. Uh, those diamonds are nice. Those, 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 so those are factory. That AP makes. So we make custom like that. It can mm-hmm. look the same, or AP makes it, but you paint. And it holds value better if it's uh, factory, right? Yes. So you want to get a factory one generally. Yeah. I'm saying some people rather save ten thousand dollars and buy an aftermarket, custom one. Oh, I so see. I can do the same thing for seven thousand dollars less. It looks exactly the same. I see. Okay. And then how much? How much would that? So watch like this, thirty seven. Yeah. So watch like this, probably a, over thirty thousand. Over thirty. Yeah. Ah, oh, Takuya, that's my boy. <laughs> he's from Texas. Oh, that's his watch. Takuya watches. Yeah, he's big. Good man. Yeah, I was actually with my friend. Uh, <clears throat> it's an artist, a musician, Julia Cole, and uh, she's a good friend of mine over the years, and she's about to blow up her music career, and. Uh, couple weeks ago we went out looking and um i'm like you know if you have a really nice watch i said people uh people in the industry will notice it yeah. you know no doubt yeah they're gonna be um they're gonna be 100%. impressed first thing i do when somebody walks in the room i look at his wrist yeah well forgive this one then no i'm saying <laughs> i one. knew who you, I, when i walked in, i didn't see it i saw the house it's different i don't care about the wrist <laughs> it's like i don't i didn't come if i didn't see you in the house yeah right? when you walk into the restaurant i see okay so Guy walks to my store, I check his knowledge. Mm. So if he knows, I know he knows what he wants, you know? Listen, I, unfortunately, this world is all judgmental. It's appearance. It unfortunately. Is, unfortunately. Unfortunately. So you got to, you know? You got to you gotta play the play the game. Yeah. And so, yeah, she, she was looking at the uh, all gold presidential, I think even 26 millimeter. Yeah, what they charge her. But she didn't buy it. 
Uh, Where'd you see it? It was at a store here. It was like uh, they were asking thirty eight. Thirty eight thousand. Mm hmm. It was new. Seems like a lot. I don't know the store out there, but don't come on, bro. Thirty eight thousand is a lot. You could buy a forty millimeter for that price. Yeah. I could sell her a forty millimeter men's size for thirty eight thousand. That watch should be in the low twenties, bro. Yeah. Well. Yeah, it's uh. So in my way. Yeah, I will. I'll have you a lot of people actually. In the, I appreciate especially it. In the in my industry. Way. I'll send you a lot of. Unfortunately, I'll send you a lot of. Uh, if I can, <laughs> patients to Mexico. <laughs> Whatever we can do to help. No, I'll, I'll give my brother your information. He has a lot of people who are going through. Unfortunately, this type of. Wow, talking about the devil. My brother's brother is calling me. The one I was telling you about. Um, I can send a, a lot of people. Unfortunately, it's not something you want to do, but. Yeah, if, if we, we can, can help, help him. Yeah, but really? especially uh, when this new lab's built with cancer. If you receive one person, it was all worth it. One, Absolutely. One soul, it's all fucking worth it, bro. Absolutely. Even if we lose them, one you say that's worth it. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that is the hardest part with cancer is over the years, you um, you lose most of them. You know, it's like you're doing your best. We're really good at extending life and uh, raising quality of life. We're really good at that. Uh, metastatic cancer, sent home to die. A lot of times, you know, they're told they got a, a month. We give them six months and a good six months but um you know the curing part uh you know we don't see near as much but we have i mean i've seen it a, i've seen it a lot it's just not near the majority if that makes sense oh, and wow. uh each one of those kind of they do they keep us going actually there's a laura's healing journey here is a, a book that i had sitting here and that was my friend uh well she became my friend laura Payne, but she had brain cancer and uh, when um it was sticking out of her head and this is back when I used to do the orientations at the hospital to, uh, during the arrivals. And I was like, I'm doing the orientation and I look in the back and there's a girl with an eye patch on and this tumor coming out of her head. I'm like, oh, she's, you know, that's, she's pretty sick to be here. You know, we don't like, you know, if someone's too sick to be at the hospital, we'd like them to, you know, if they're, they're going to pass, pass at home with their family type thing, you know. Uh, but, you know, we, we're like, okay, let's, let's see what's going on with her. Well, she had drove, uh, driven from Knoxville, Tennessee, all the way to Tijuana, Mexico, Whoa. Uh, because she couldn't fly because the pressure on the plane would have uh, hurt her head, and she was blind in her her left eye. And um, so, but I, her, she had she was just like vibrant, you know. She just had the best attitude of you know pretty much anybody I ever met. It was her and her husband Cody. And um, so, about two weeks in, she sent me a, a message and uh, said. Uh, I can see. I'm like, that's a good sign. That's a good Whoa. sign. And so I uh, couldn't really tell that from the tumor, but, and then, um, uh, it's just still a little blurry, but I can actually, you know, I can actually tell I can see it. And, and then, you know, a couple of weeks later, she could fully see, didn't have to have the patch. And, uh, she was in hospice back home when she drove across the, the, the country to see us. They told her you're done. Yeah. And, um, we gave her about three years, three and a half years. Um, and you know, we got about 80% reduction in the tumor to where you couldn't see it anymore in her head. Um, and it came back and we fought, I mean, we, it was a constant fight, but you know, that's one of those cases that I would look at as a, as a, as a win, you know, we, she passed. Yeah. She eventually passed. Well, uh, but she didn't suffer like she did when no, she, we gave her three plus good years, quality life. Um, she became a, a good friend and she passed over wow. COVID, but, um, yeah, so you have stories like that. So we did good there, but we didn't, you know, uh, cure her. And we have a lot of stories like that where we really extend life. But getting that final, you know, you curing have a lot cancer. Of kids coming to you? No, we do not treat kid, uh, no. kids. No, it's uh, you know a lot of times there's custody issues and taking a kid to Mexico. You know, it's just but not. If the parents are together and shit. You won't take them. No, no, it's just too risky. Um. Some states will like uh, charge the parent too with child endangerment if they don't do the standard of care. Like, no way. Oh yeah, absolutely. It, it happens. It, it happens. Um, in some states, it's like uh, you know, child services will take the kid away. You know, that's happened, and force the kid to get the treatment that the parent might not want him to get. Uh, there's money involved. But yeah, I mean, they're, you know, that they, they would be saying that you know this is the most scientifically proven way to. Uh, extend the kid's life. Yeah, you know, even if the kid's terminal, it's like let the parent. If the parent doesn't want the kid to suffer, yeah. like maybe they, they should try something different. If there's nothing that can be done, my brother was supposed to take his daughter to some place in Texas. MD or, Anderson. 
I have no idea. They have it's probably MD Anderson. <clears throat> they're the they're they're the best. They're they do they a really good job. And, but she she didn't make it to there. Like they had an yeah. appointment. So it's it's better that you know she was she was suffering. Like she was already blind and she couldn't boils everywhere. She was already like what's the point? Yeah, man, it's so hard. You know, with uh, if you haven't seen it, gone through the process of somebody that's dying mm. uh, with cancer, it's it's it's, it's a shock. You know, because people can also look completely normal. You would never know they had cancer. I mean, that's like one of the. Uh, what is it? Uh, How does it eat up your fucking system? Like, you become literally like. Yeah, well, I mean, if it's in inside the body, you know, you can't see it. But you know, let's say you have a liver and it just grows all over the liver, and all of a sudden your liver can't function. You know, the we do something. Uh, we do really well with a squamous cell uh, of the mouth and throat. And the interesting thing about that cancer, a lot of times it's growing outside. You know, you can actually yeah. see the tumor. So when it's going away, I, we had a guy with a tumor the size of a basketball. I remember seeing him at the hospital off of his head. It was like a second head. I was like, oh my God. And it was hard to look at. You know, it was, it was, it was difficult and it felt horrible for the guy. But I, it was one of those that I was like, gosh, he's probably not going to do, you know, it, it's, it's close. Within seven weeks, the tumor was completely gone seven weeks same thing it came back we got it completely gone but not gone enough and uh it came back we got it down again the third time it uh it, it took them but uh you know when you can see the tumors and then they go away that's when it's it, it does that's something different see, yeah. yeah but if it's inside the body it's hard for people to get as excited you know with it one of the things that we're going to be doing is our ct we're going to be 3d printing uh the tumors from the scans based on uh, oh, wow. you know, the CT so we can actually, patients can actually see the size and the next time, hopefully if it's smaller, they can see how much it shrinks. So, Cause it, the idea I had on that one was like that guy's tumor that you could actually see or Laura's tumor that you could see. And then she can, you know, then it went away off her head. Uh, if someone can see their tumor getting smaller in a scan and, you know, we, we print out the, the right. size of it, like psychologically it makes you feel better. Yeah. Well, we have a class called the power of the mind. Yeah. Uh, because that's another thing they don't do in mainstream medicine. 80% of cure of cancer is. Yeah. There's, it's a, it's a, it's a major aspect of it. You think about in sports, imagine training a fighter and be like, don't worry about your mind. Don't visualize like, you know, eat whatever you want. You know, that's what, that's what they do for cancer in America. They say, you know, your mind, they don't even focus on it. We have two full-time psychologists that our patients, uh, go to, um, two to three times a week. We have two power of the mind classes um, where we focus on what it takes to be a champion. This is the ultimate fight. Like it, it was a kind of a fighting aspect, wow. but you're, you're fighting the cancer. You better have the right mindset to beat that. And um, it does, it does really well. Of course. So we're, we're working on everything. You know, it's where it's not just like, Oh, you're going to do chemo and done. It's like, we do chemo, but we give about a 20% dose uh, than the regular. We give pa patients uh, insulin to drop their blood sugar uh, when we're doing it, we uh, add a couple other things that potentiate the effects of the stuff, chemotherapy. Maybe, and, no, I mean, I'd say about five to ten percent of the patients have the nausea side effect with us, whereas ninety percent. Yeah, so um, insane. Yeah, it's insane. the color changes on your fingers and your toes. Oh. It's awful, man. When you've seen somebody go through it and you see that it actually changes people, you're probably a threat to the. You know. <laughs> I don't to the, think so because so now immunotherapy has become such a big thing and our hospital before we bought it. Um, uh, well, it, have you heard the story of how, how we like the hospital and how it opened? No. Oh, okay. So chips had been there for 40 years. Um, it was originally the, the Gerson hospital, which was Gerson therapy, which is a diet therapy. And um, <clears throat> I'd heard about it years before, but my mom was sick and, um, and we didn't have any options in America. And so I'd read a study on something called Coley's toxins for rheumatoid arthritis. It was like a, it was a study in 1923. I was like, that makes sense. It's opposite of what mainstream tells us to do where they have us suppress the immune system. This uh, stimulates the immune system quickly, acutely. And so there was one hospital in Mexico that had it, but it had closed wow. two years before. And so Scotty Dederick and I found the original owner uh, Whoa. bought the hospital from him, hired back the original staff. Uh, and my mom came in a wheelchair and she left three weeks later walking. Get the fuck out yeah, of here. Yeah. She's been in remission for eight and a half years. 
So that was the catalyst that started it all. Um, but it was based on this is not supposed to work, but you know what? So you believe, I believe God did that all for you to open this. Uh, yeah. Research to help the world. I'm telling you, you're going to see. And Teddy's like, fuck all. It's going to come to you like, <laughs> God sent something to your mom for you to get this hospital to help people with cancer. Yeah. No, you, absolutely. You, 10 years ago, you thought you were going to do something like this? No. No way, man. Right. No way. Yeah. It's, um, I it's never thought crazy. Of. But yeah, and then we wow. built it based on like the same is 100% cured everything. Uh, so if you were to look at my mom's hands and feet, yeah, that's, she had so much damage from the RA. Uh, right. It was completely destroyed, but so she's not in a wheelchair. Oh, but she gets around great now. She's wow. walking. She, she no, it's she's three weeks. Yeah, well, three. It was three weeks, and then we focused on her diet at home, uh, and gave her things to take home with her that she could. But it's like, how the hell did you find this fucking doctor? I wasn't a doctor. I read a study. No, how'd you find oh. this hospital? The owner of the hospital. How'd you find? Uh, so Scotty and I went to TJ, and we asked. Got went to a real estate agent and showed him the hospital we wanted. And he's like, I know who owns that, and got a hold of the owner, wow. and uh, that's how we did it. <laughs> you know, it was a good one, man. It's a blessing, but wow. uh, yeah, that's I mean, that's that's how we started. So I think, but when we added things throughout the years, power of the mind. We had a music program that was there before COVID, but we would fly two musicians from Nashville every week to play for our patients because music is healing too, right? So it was a very holistic, you know, cutting edge treatments, but we we feel like. You know, diet. Um, you don't give them time to think about their sickness, right? You exactly. keep them occupied all the time. Yeah, diet, power of the mind, you know, just it's it's holistic. And all those things matter. And we would be the worst coaches ever if we were training fighters to not focus on their diet, not focus on their mind. Like guys would go and lose or, you know, just be out of shape. Um, so why would we do the same? Why, why wouldn't we do that for cancer patients? Oh, wow. Yeah. Nothing here. No. People just dying on Sloan Catering in New York, left and right. Yeah, I mean it's 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 tough though. Like, like I, numbers, I, next, 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 yeah. next. You know, my brother went to the doctor. Said, "How? You know, did you do everything in your power?" So the doctor was like a, a a Jewish doctor. So he played the guilt trip. He's like, did you do everything in your power to save my daughter? Can you go to sleep at night knowing that you did everything in your power to save my daughter? Mm -hmm. He said, "No, I can't. Can't pass regulations. Yeah. I can't." That's the truth, man. He said, can you go to sleep at night? He said, I can't. Because mm. there's, there's a system which you cannot, you know, cross, I guess, because he's the head of the Sloan Catering Hospital there for children. Yeah. But, you know, now that we know that there's something like what you have over there, it could probably be a game changer. Yeah, I think, you know, especially for diagnosis and yeah. helping find those treatments that can that can work for make patients. It easier. So scaring the patient, you teach them how to cope with it, how to understand it, how to, it's going to be okay and have a positive mindset. Because once negative gets in there, it's done. So my dad survived because he believed that he doesn't have cancer. That's awesome. Like, I don't believe it. It's not going to take me. I mean, that's it. He's like, no, I don't give a fuck. Um, I'm not going to die from this shit. And he, that's what he told me. He said, 80% of the people I went to, they're all sitting there depressed. Like, I used to do my shit and go home like nothing happened. Yeah. I swear, it's all in the mindset. Yeah, I mean, it's it's all in the mindset. It's it's it go back to the watches, you know. You being successful, you building your brand, it's mindset. Yeah, you know, you helping the kids, it's mindset. You're teaching people how to be successful. Yeah, you don't have a loser are... mindset. You have a winner mindset. You know, you know? you'd rather them. Well, one of these kids' fathers, like he's religious, and I told the kid, I told the father, listen, yeah, the community's gonna pressure you that your son is not in school. You rather them be a bum on the street. And lie to you that he's in school or he's learning, but he's doing drugs or whatever the fuck he's doing out there. Mm -hmm. No. Bring him to the city. Bring him to work. He'll make money. He'll build himself a future. And at 21 years old, he'll have his own business. What else can you And it's free. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm paying him. I'm, I'm saying it's good for me because he, he sells. I know the kid is a hustler. Some, some kids, you see it in them. As, at a young age, you know they're going to be like, you know. Some kids, you got to mold and teach and given the confidence some kids were so like they had no confidence growing up or the parents didn't like raise them with confidence or say oh you're nothing you know or whatever so you gotta every kid is every child in the world has a talent mm -hmm. so you have to find it nobody's nobody has no talent there's no such thing yeah every person in this world has a purpose and has a talent you just gotta your your job is to find it and bring it out of them that's what i believe 
Yeah, I might be wrong, but I don't think I'm wrong. No, I I, I agree. I mean, it's and, and and they have these specific systems that yeah. oh, you're supposed to just do this and be this way. Like I couldn't sit through a classroom, man. I'm I gonna, hate it. I can't. I, I lose. No, America doesn't teach you how to be an entrepreneur. No, it should be all. in their system. 401k, yeah. and then you pay their taxes when you do this. You retire, you play golf, and you drop dead. Yeah. But then there's people like us who are all day our minds. Do you sleep on that? I can't sleep. My brain <laughs> thinks while I sleep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I wake up at three in the morning, think about a watch, see if I got a message, go back. My brain constantly works. Is that healthy? Probably not. But you know, it's the ADD I have, and it's okay. Yeah. Better than taking medicine and looking at a wall. Absolutely. And man. The therapist telling me it's going to be a little. I'll pass. I'll. I'll sleep. My father says, when you pass away, you'll sleep your whole life. <laughs> now it's time to, you know, to run. How much do you sleep a night? What do you say? I sleep from like two to seven. So five hours. Five, six hours. I go to the gym every day at eight in the morning. <clears throat> yeah, so I don't get, get to, to work. If you like get up you to look. six, which you really need seven, uh, but you drastically reduce your risk of Alzheimer's. That's, really? that's, the, that's the main reason I focus on my sleep. I need uh, to. Because of dementia and Alzheimer's. See, I don't so, know this shit. Yeah, it's like, just uh, it's a, it's one of the one of the big factors is how much you sleep correlates with if you get dementia, and Alzheimer's. So if you could fit in seven, I know it's tough. You know, you can have your brain. Well, you'll not, never not, have that. You sleep like twenty hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I I barely sleep, and even when I sleep, I don't sleep. Yeah, this is I'm jet lagged all the time. Yeah, man, that's tough. I go there, I can't fucking sleep because twelve hours ahead, so. I'll, and when I don't sleep a lot, I start hallucinating. Right? You'll sit down like, fuck, I got to close my I eyes. Know. I can see shit. I'm not sleeping. Really? Because your brain, you have to, body has to rest. It does, man. Right? Do you take any supplements? Nothing. That's, I take protein shakes after the gym. I got to, I know there's a whole like supplements, like vitamin this. I got to get into it. Yeah. Problem is I, I'm, I'm very pro routine. Mm -hmm. So I have a certain way I drive to work every fucking day. <laughs> yeah. Take this lane, this time, this way. And every time I go, I go out of my routine. Something fucks up, so I, uh, I'm crazy. Yeah. So, same thing. So if I take supplement, I feel like it's uh, something new to add to my routine. But yeah. I, I know I have to do it, right? Yeah. So I need somebody wants to, have to shove, like, tell me what to take and shove it down my throat. Then it becomes part of my routine. I'm the same right? way. Yeah, I hate when, when way. I travel. I'm not, I don't have a routine. When yeah. I'm at Hong, when I'm in Hong Kong or, or Japan or Dubai, I don't have a routine. It makes me crazy. Yeah. I wake up when I want to go to uh, be up all night, sleep, you know, sometimes and can't sleep, and then my routine gets fucked. It's hard, bro. It's hard. It's hard, but yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't have twelve hours. I have two hours of you know difference in Tijuana, and that alone is hard for me. Yeah, can so I can't imagine. imagine doing the go to L.A. from here. It's same shit. It's yeah. what, oh, here to L.A. Is how, oh, two, two hours. hours. Two oh. hour time distance. It's four hour flight. Yeah, time. But, time is twelve, bro. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's hours. like we're not even, you know, like I'm, when you I'm sleep, not even, I wake up. When yeah. I wake up, you sleep. It's crazy. Then I have the whole office to run here because no, I don't ask. I don't talk to, like, everybody asks, my partner is the one who tells me what's going on. So all the employees answer to him. Mm -hmm. He makes decisions and he comes to me and we, I tell him, like, we decide together and he implements all the rules and everything. I live everything. Because I told him, listen, I'm building the brand for us. Yeah. I'm doing the buying. I'm traveling. I'm going to be, like, you know, the face. You're the fucking brains. You're young. You're a hustler. You're not even 30 years old yet. You know, you're smarter than me in the, in the back office. Wait, it's your thing. So he would call me when I'm in Hong Kong. It's like for, uh, let's say I'm in Japan, it's Friday, I'm, I just finished work. It's 12 o'clock at night, it's 12 afternoon here. Just smack him in the day. He'll call me at one in the morning. And once you wake up, when you're jet lagged, you're never falling back asleep. Mm. That's the trick. He wants you, got to put your phone down. And even if you can't fall asleep, you just rest your eyes. Yeah. Just your eyes are closed. And then eventually, I think the body will just go into a sleeping mode. Yeah. But once you wake up, the phone buzzes. It's over. I can't. And it buzzes every day. 3 a.m. a buzz. Fuck. I'm up. Yeah. That's it. You know? Yeah, man. How many mistakes I made buying watches I'm not supposed to buy for a high price because I'm not sleeping? Yeah, <laughs> probably a lot. That is. That is. I'll come like, fuck. Like, what did I do? Yeah. Because you're not thinking straight. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, like, I mean, there's, I'll give you a list of stuff, but like, something as simple as magnesium, you know, 350 to 500 milligrams before you sleep. There's no side effects. Magnesium, no, it's 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 very good for you. So, um, so I need it. I'm, I'm yeah, sure I vitamin. need something like to calm my brain down. To, to calm. Also, the anxiety of every day of providing to make sure everything's okay. To you know, you have expenses. I'm sure you have 200 employees. I'm not even close to that. Hopefully, one day I will. Yeah, you'll be there. 
the anxiety of running a business, running an operation, making sure everybody's okay, you know, consequences, God forbid, you know. I don't know how, how to, to turn it off. Yeah, well, you can't, I mean, it's, it's hard to turn it off, man. I mean, it's like, for, I mean, I, and I, I didn't sleep for years. Now I'm focusing on it more just because of the Alzheimer thing. <laughs> it really, like, I don't even the, know that. No, that's yeah, that's the, that's the one. It's like, I've, I've got to get my sleep. And uh, sometimes, what, sometimes seven my hours? brain just won't shut off. But Minimum seven hours? I mean, seven's about, yes. I mean, if you're hitting six, you're, you know, at least six, you're doing decent. But, you know, seven's really the number you want, minimum, if you can. I don't sleep at 12, then. Fuck. And I have FOMO, you know, FOMO. Is? One, two, yeah. Yeah, seven, yeah. 12 to, yeah, but yeah, 12 to seven. And I have FOMO. That's, I feel like I'm missing on something. You're going right? to feel a lot better, though. For sure. You're going to feel a lot better, you know. And getting on like a flaxseed oil, it's uh, uh, really, really good for you, good for your brain. I mean, there's little things that we can do that, you know, reduce the risk of, uh, you know, disease later. You know, things that are really, what do you got to worry about? You got to worry about, about your heart, yeah. your brain, as a man, your prostate, make sure your prostate's good. Yeah. Like those three things are, are the keys. Yeah, you know, uh, not becoming diabetic. You know, it's pretty easy to have, you know, once you're over 40, yeah, it's not um, you got to you gotta watch it. You got to check that blood sugar number, make sure you're not pre-diabetic because a lot of people don't know that they're pre-diabetic and uh, all of a sudden they have diabetes. You're pre-diabetic, you better get on it. You know, there's something called metformin that uh, is really, you know, a lot of people take. Uh, it actually, uh, people that don't have diabetes take it. It messes up my stomach, so I, that's the reason I don't. But I, there's like about 10% of people have that side effect. I'm one of them, unfortunately. But if I didn't have that side effect, I'd be taking it daily. Um, and uh, it regulates your blood sugar, reduces your risk of cancer. Uh, they were noticing in a study that those that took metformin were living longer than those that didn't, uh, no whether they had diabetes or not. So, um, let me it, ask you something. When you were fighting, when you, when you, they could put you like on a strict, like diet where you can eat, where you can't eat, like those super strict. Yeah. I, I would cut. So I would cut to, uh, 170 or actually for shoot, it was 167. Uh, but I'd walk around between 190 and 200 and then, you know, cut the weight. I, I wrestled, you know. Uh, so you cut the weight. How long do you have to cut the weight? I mean, I could lose twenty pounds in a day, really, if I needed to. Day, day and a half. Really? Uh, it's water weight. We have a lot of water in us, but um, it's not healthy. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I could lose that much weight. But it's it's strict diet, low, uh, you know, specific amount of calories, specific amount of, of proteins. Eating multiple times a day is really important. So, like, you know, yeah. you want to eat five I was on that times. diet a year ago, and then I'm like, you know what? Let's go to the gym every day and eat what the fuck I want. And because I cut down, I so my heaviest was 240. When I went on a gambling speed, lost my money, I went down to 148 in six months. I lost weight unhealthy. I went up to 190. Last year, I cut down to 163, and I was, like, shredded when I went nice. to the gym. But then... I can't. I can't enjoy my life. But food sucked. They didn't taste good. Seriously, yeah, like, I get it. I would go out to a restaurant. I love sweets. I can't have a chocolate. I was like, you know, fuck it. I'm done. Yeah. I'm reaching 40s old. So thank God I have money. They like me for my money. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I start. I don't eat what I want. Like I don't go off. But I won't watch what I eat. But I'll go to the gym every day. But I put on 20 pounds. Yeah. Yeah. It'll. It'll. It'll it's happen. It's hard, man. Especially once we reach like that later. Like I'm almost 40. The body doesn't fucking react like it, it used when I was 20 man. years old. It doesn't, you know. But I mean, if you get to what, you can still eat relatively good and stay healthy, you know. Like for me, I've got meal preps in my my freezer that uh, yeah, Shelby yeah. and Nicole get me. I put them in the microwave, you know, they, I can tell how much protein they have. It's just math. And I, I want to make sure I get a certain amount of protein a day. So basically, it's, it's like a pound of protein yeah, uh, per, per body fat or a, a uh, a gram of protein per body fat. Yeah, per uh, per, per, per pound. Weight. Per pound. Yeah, yeah, per pound. So I'm, one, I'm one seventy five after one hundred seventy five grams of protein a day. Yeah, but if you're if you're hitting less than that, you know it's okay. I mean, you're, as long as you're getting a good amount of protein, you know you don't have to be perfect with it. Uh, and then as if you're exercising, you can eat, you know, a couple big meals a week. I can't. My night. body, my body won't handle it. It won't. It goes right here to the gut, man. I'm the same way, bro. I'm the same one. Like I, 
I got, uh, I yeah. can't lose this fuck. Like, I lost it, now it's back. And I look, and I was like, what the fuck did I do now? You ate too much. <laughs> <laughs> Same Listen, way. I love fast food, man. Oh, I yeah? I love that shit. Oh, uh, you were talking about in and out what do you, What's your go-to, though, in New York? Nowhere. Nowhere. Yeah, it's not. Uh, pizza. Yeah, what do you, like, who's the best pizza in New York? Woof. You know, one time, Dave Portnoy, you know, they, I love that guy, Barstool. I love him. Yeah, I do too. So he always, I used to love, I love pizza. He rated pizza a Sally's in Connecticut. I'm like, fuck it. It was Sunday. I was bored. I said, I'm driving. It was two hours each way, bro, to try the pizza. I was like, fuck it. I'm not to do. Sunday was a year and a half ago. I was like, wow. Ah. Fuck it. I took the car. Called my brother like, you're down to go. I was like, no, just bring me back. I said, all right, I'm out. I drove two hours to Connecticut, got the pizza. I ate it. I'm like, Wow. I ate the whole fucking pie. <laughs> I ordered oh, a medium. Man. That shit was one of the best pizzas I've ever had in my life. It's called a Sally's in uh, Connecticut. But in New York, Joel's is good. Danny's is good in Queens. Uh, my brother had a franchise of called Bravo's. That was good. But I stopped eating. Honestly, I, pizza's my weakness. It's one of my favorite foods, but I try to stop eating it because it gives me fucking heartburn, man. Oh, you deal with heartburn? Oh, yeah. Me too, man. Me too. Acid reflex is uh, tomatoes, bread, that shit. I know, I, man. I can't breathe. Uh, last night, uh, I had a, a jet broker in. We're buying a, a plane we got to get by the end of the year. And uh, sitting there, spaghetti and meat, my favorite spaghetti and meatballs. Oh, my God. That's Harper galore. And I'm like, and sure enough, <laughs> I woke up shit. this morning or like a uh, middle of, uh, it's like acid coming out. You yeah, know? I get it right away. Yeah. First, I can't drink orange juice. First gulp. I'm fucked. I feel like coming out of my nose. Oh, gosh. So I don't drink orange. Do you take medication? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah, I try not to. Of I'm me. like a w once a week guy. Yeah, I'll take some Tums. Uh, you ever tried Dexalent? What is it? Dexalent. Mm -mm. Sick medication for heartburn and works. Than... Really? Dexalent? Yeah. But check that one out. It works in a, literally 20 minutes. Okay. Gone. <laughs> You have to look that one up. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't like like you. I don't like taking medication. Yeah. So and those uh, uh, inhibitors, there's actually like some evidence that they, you know, increase your risk of esophageal cancer. Yeah, that's why I get I get freaked out, man. Yeah, that's no, smart. You don't you don't want to, but you also you don't want too much acid going up there either. Yeah. all the time. You know, so my like father suffers from it. I don't know. I think it's in the family. Yeah, it's like it's recently buying a jet. What's that? Buying a private jet. Yeah. How much does that cost? Like thirty million? No, it's not that much. It's not that much. This one. But it's like you have to, but you have to pay every day. It's parked on the tarmac. Yeah, the, the expensive part. Well, you understand. Um, have you heard about how the how the taxes work with jets? Zero. Ooh, you might buy a jet after we talk here. <laughs> no. <laughs> 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 so, um, okay, this year's eighty percent uh, depreciation. You can take off your jet. Next year it's it's sixty, but it was a hundred for like five years. That's why the jet industry went crazy. Uh, the prices went high. So let's say you make I'm gonna say five million bucks. If you buy a jet for five million dollars, like a used jet for five million dollars, yeah, paid off in one shot. No, you put twenty percent down. So you put a million dollars down. Okay, you can write off the whole jet that year and pay no taxes on five million dollars. So you actually make money by buying the jet because you'd pay, like, pay so you don't point. pay taxes out of the five million. No. Yeah, you finance it. So no, you, second, so you buy the jet for five million bucks. You made five million dollars this year, for mm -hmm. example, right? Mm -hmm. You buy the jet for five million bucks. You tell the IRS, "I'm not paying you this year because I bought a jet." Yes. Do you don't pay zero. Uh, well, this year is eighty percent of five million actually. So it was hundred. Whatever before. it is. Yes. Eighty percent. So basically, if you made five million in New York, you're going to pay probably a little bit, one point five, one point eight million in taxes because New York City loves to take our money, and I have to pay zero. I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't know about state tax, but federal income well, state tax. State tax is not the federal. What's the federal tax then? By, I don't have to ask my account. But. Yeah, like the U.S. tax. Like New York has state tax. Tennessee, we don't have a state tax, which is wow. nice. But um, yeah, so you can, so you save, you know, two million on taxes, yeah. put a million down, save two million on taxes, so you come out a million ahead. Yeah, but then the problem is, okay, you save the money, but now you got to fuck park at that bait. Where are you going to park this Oh, guy? yeah. So, you know, you have your operating expenses. So right. you have your fixed and then your variable. You know, your fixed, um, you know, depending on what plane you got, it's, let's say it's in the 5 million range, depending on the plane, you're looking at about five to $650,000 a year fixed. And then the variable, you're probably looking at about an extra 2,500 to 4,000 an hour. 
to fly it. So you're probably going to spend about a million five if you're flying 400 hours a year. So, um, okay. So what are you doing? It's parked. You are not going to like jet smart it or rent it out or something. You're just going to leave it. I'm not, but, um, I mean, because of the tax in, uh, benefits of it, I mean, it, it would be smart to open a private jet business and buy the plane so you can yeah. use that depreciation for your other companies or, you know, because, because LLCs are pass throughs. Right. So, uh, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, you can. Wow, I didn't even know that. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. De the depreciation game, man. When when you become a multimillionaire, uh, it, it's key. Your number one expense is taxes. Yeah. And so you know you, you got to figure out how to you know legally pay as little as possible. That's the game. Like I want I I, I want to pay as little as possible yeah. legally. The biggest pain for me, I'd rather just blow it in a casino than give it to the fucking government. <laughs> yeah. When they take my, so I pay my LLC taxes every year. So it's one shot. They stick it in my ass when they're instead yeah. of putting KY before they just shove it right in. And it, I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? But the IRS, that's, like, that's the big one. Yeah. You know, that's where they hit you with the, uh, you know, like, what am I doing? Like, well, what are they doing with the money? <laughs> they're uh, building stadiums. I don't know. There's trillions of dollars that have been Give lost. It to the immigrants in New York City. So what's going on there? Yeah. What's it like right now? Shit. A block away from us, 47th Street. They took the whole Roosevelt Hotel, made it a fucking five-star hotel. They made it a fucking shelter for all The Roosevelt? Things. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's a shelter? It's on Madison Avenue and 46th Street. Oh, man. Why did they do that? All immigrants there. What's that? All immigrants. Yeah, but why did the uh, Roosevelt agree to that? Why wouldn't they government fucking renting out your whole building? Oh, the government's just renting yeah, it out. Yeah, they don't give a shit. Oh, my gosh. It took a five-star hotel. Wow. Anywhere around the Midtown area. You flooded them on all, and so you can you can see them everywhere. Everywhere, kids outside, mothers, it's, children outside, ten at night, twelve at night, packed outside. It's like literally, like it's crazy. I never saw something this in my life. It's unbelievable that they they're they're allowing it. I mean, it's just like they're coming they're, by planes and, and buses and whatever. And why in New York City? It's fucking cold. Well, I, I know that the the they started just busing them up there just to be. Uh, jerks to New York City. That's what they were doing for. Oh yeah, that was why. That was that's what started it all. They were busing in there, like oh yeah, well uh, you know Biden, will you pay attention if it's in New York? Yeah. And saying oh yeah, the mayor of New York complaining, but the mayor of New York was before talking about how he would always take the immigrants in. Right, so he had no choice to put the money. Put you, put yeah, so and they've done that to the to the uh, liberal cities, man. It's pretty funny. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's like well, because you know Biden, the Biden administration, they don't seem to care about Texas. Texas has been. Yeah, you know, uh, taking the brunt of the load the whole time. It's like it's not fair, and so yeah, that Texas started busting them out. And uh, smart, yeah, they killed us though. So there's a big retail store called Lauren B Jewelry Store, literally right next to the Roosevelt Hotel. They took it. They had to shut down. Well, man, they took it over. Yeah, it's. Uh, they have all their mopeds outside, and they just drive around the city, unlicensed, unregistered, <laughs> unvaccinated, according to New York City, which was the biggest crime in the world. Right, running around. The kids are in the school. Unvaccinated when public schools you have to have vaccines to get in. It's crazy. Yeah, it's jammed. Totally well, I mean, jammed. It, you know they they just let them in. My girlfriend flew back from Colombia. Uh, you know, she was in Egypt and Turkey, as I was telling you. But then she w flew through Colombia, and uh, her dad was U.S. District Attorney in uh, the Virgin Islands, and so she flew from Colombia to Puerto Rico. Her family lives in Puerto Rico now, and. Um, they searched her, but they took her back. She said they literally grabbed her vagina, like, to see if she had drugs. Stop. I know, man. I'm like, what the hell? They, they're letting all these yeah. immigrants in, but and they're citizen, sexually they're assaulting my girlfriend. I mean, it was a female. Uh, Good luck uh, even trying to go after them. Yeah, no, I'm going to fight. This is happening today, so I'm going to actually. I got fucked coming in from uh, Dubai. I have global entry. Not anymore. They revoked it because listen to the stupid story. So I walk in, I come from Dubai, I get in. <clears throat> so they're like, uh, you have anything to declare? I said, no. All right, go to secondary. Open your bag. They open my bag. I have a pair of Chanel shoes in there, sneakers, and a bag. He's like, is it new? So I, oh. I said, yeah, I just bought it. He's like, why don't you declare it? So I don't have to declare. It's fucking shoes I bought for myself. Anything over $800, you have to declare. It's in the global entry thing. I said, bro, you think anybody reads that fucking uh, global entry, the whatever it is? Right. Just press accept and that's it. Sit down. Ugh. How much is the bag? I, I, I got it for, I don't remember, five, six thousand. I told him five thousand. All right, sit down. 
he goes he goes on the on the computer he's like you're a fucking liar I said why it's ten thousand online I said, so what I'm telling you what I paid show me a receipt or you're lying to me I, said, I don't have a receipt sit down now I had my RM on my wrist bro I have chains and my car like I have Cartiers I wore my and I had two watches in my bag a 57 12 Patek and the <laughs> other watch so he's about to let me go these two fucking rednecks walk in tatted up like this assholes to the Boston hmm. fuck that all these bro he tore me a new asshole he take all your fucking jewelry off he fucking strip searched me to my underwear made me cough squat I said bro you think I'm fucking smuggling drugs in there no you're smuggling a watch I said in my asshole where am I putting the watches, bro? So, because I put, I had watch AP boxes with me in the luggage. So when I went to Dubai, I take the boxes with me and I ship the watches. I never carry watches with me because sure. you have to pay customs duties. So I mm -hmm. ship it through Brinks, Ferrari, Malkamit, where I pay the duties. It's armed guard, right? Mm -hmm. Insured. I have to pay 1%, 2%, whatever the US customs charge me. And then they release the package to me. That's what I do. So I told him, here's the watches there in Dubai. I'm fucking paying duties on them. Sit down. He took all my watches off. He took a picture. He's like, your watch on the wrist is a million dollars. I said, first of all, it's a hundred grand. Second of all, even if it's a million dollars, it's my watch. Prove it to me. So I opened the picture. I said, yeah, I wore them before I left here. What did I say? Then I had, you know, um, so us Jews, when we pray in the morning, we wrap, right? We put the, we wrap. It's called tefillin. We wrap. So it's a Jewish prayer. Like, it has a scroll inside. We put it on our head. We put it on our, if you're right, lefty, you put it on your right. Done. I'm gonna preach about religion, about are you know I'm gonna take the pity card. Fuck it, why not? Everybody else does it. I'm doing it too. Before I left, he made me sign a waiver that I cannot go after them. Wait, what? Why did it... he made me sign it? If not, I'm not released. So he said you have two options. You pay me thirty five hundred dollar penalty, twenty nine hundred, sorry, penalty for not declaring the bag, or I take the bag, but you have to sign this waiver that you can't sue us. I say, no, I want to get the fuck out of here. I had a lot of merchandise on me. I went out. I signed. I left. Call an attorney. I'm like, fuck, I'm going to call anyway. Yeah. And he's like, you cannot go after them. What? Yeah. I have. I still have it in my bag. I think over, wherever my bag is over there, I have it. Wow. I would love to go after them. I'll have to ask her if she signed that, man. No, if, more if, she, a... if she had nothing, then they let her go. Then no, I had I had merchandise. They wouldn't let me go unless I signed it. Yeah, no, she didn't have anything. That was that was what was but you should, up. If if you have it on camera, you should go after them. Yeah, I mean, they're I, assholes. I'm man. gonna talk to her. I before. love her. I love our country, but sometimes authority takes way too. Well, yeah, I mean, I I have respect for border yeah. patrol. I really do. I feel that they have a really tough job. But why? You now know, they stop me every time. And I yeah. go three every three weeks. They stop me. And I told the guy, "You dumbass! You think I'm gonna? You stop me once? You think I'm gonna bring merchandise? You're gonna stop me every time for seven years?" So they revo revoked my global entry right away. That shit for 10 years Done I have to wait wow. online With everybody else For three fucking hours but Because everybody's on lunch Then I have to go through The fucking secondary Every time Yeah I told the lady You want to go through My dirty laundry every day Like you know I'm not I don't have anything with me Like right. protocol Like come on bro Get with the program Yeah Random select me Every three times Maybe I'll smuggle Something in And you'll catch me But if I know I'm getting stopped Every time I'm not bringing anything I'm not even bringing I don't even wear a watch yeah. I wear nothing when I leave because now I know they're going to stop me. Mm. You understand? I do. I do. But at that waiver, fuck me. Yeah. I would have went after him with the religious article shit. I would have taken a whole ride with that, bro. Which is like, I don't know why they aren't kind. You know, he that's thought what he caught up. a fish. He What's thought he caught a whale. Oh, I have all this merchandise. He can't take it away because it's mine. I proved to him that it's mine. Right? So they, legally, he's right. He said, they, before you leave this country, you have to declare everything you wear. Anything over eight hundred dollars, let's say you're wearing that Bradley, it's worth three grand or five grand. You gotta go to TSA and claim that it's yours before you leave. They give you a slip. So once you pass customs, you can if they stop you, you give it to them. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah, you told me that. Anything over eight hundred dollars that you're taking with you. Jewelry, watches, anything you gotta declare when you leave. So when you come back, they know that you didn't buy it from outside and you're not invading the taxes. Wow. That's the law. I, I had no idea. Yeah. I mean, I had absolutely no idea. Um, so that was that's what he told me. Next time I stop you, you better make sure you have those paperwork. 
Every time I get a flight into Boston, I say no. I'd rather fucking pay twenty grand and go through New York. Like when I have the points flight through Boston, I don't want to go through Boston ever again. Wow. Yeah, some that's four that's hours, weird. bro. He kept me there, like I'm a fucking druggie. Like I have cocaine up my ass. Like, bro, come on. Find me. I told him, pay me ten grand. Get the fuck out. Whatever you want, just let me leave. No, sit right there. Keep your mouth shut. I just sat like a little bitch. What am I gonna tell him? Yeah. That's, uh... What am I gonna tell him? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. When he left, I said, what are you going to do with the money? I already left. He's like, I can't even keep the money because he paid by credit card. I said, good. And I bounced. He let me go. But wow. I couldn't I can't, I can't. couldn't sue them. I would love to sue them. Yeah, it's just uh, it's a kindness thing. I don't understand, you know, with my girl, like why. They, she, she said they uh, like literally went through everything she had. Oh, yeah. She had uh, she had a squat and cough because they thought she had something in her. Like, this really to be insane. And she said then the lady put her hand yeah. up her vagina. And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, no, she like grabbed it. She's like, I couldn't believe it. She should, she should go after that. I mean, like. I mean, I think they have the authority, I think, to do it. But I mean, if they have, that's, I want to see what the law is. I mean, maybe that's what they, maybe that's what they do. I mean, it's, it's just, it, it doesn't seem right. Yeah, I think she told her, she, I mean, uh, she told him that her dad was U.S. District Attorney, you know, like, <laughs> it's not like I'm a, yeah. Criminal, and they were suggesting she was either a prostitute or um, what? Uh, muling drugs because she was coming from Colombia, and she's also got her Colombian citizenship too. So she's U.S. citizen and Colombian citizen. So what? Yeah. So it's like they were like, oh, we, you know, yeah. they were just like, these immigrants come in here. Exactly. That's how we got all this. So like, how do? We, yeah. One, two, three. Yeah. See just that? Go right ahead. Go right ahead. You know, but you have American citizens. You know, I don't. Even, I don't even have health insurance, bro. In New York City or whatever. The, the health insurance here is fucked. This whole system. I don't. I don't want to get into politics, but I have no health insurance because they want to charge me three thousand dollars a month. I'd rather pay out of pocket. I need to go to the doctor. Sure. My boy's a doctor. I call me. Yo, I don't feel well. Come to my house and try to take this three thousand dollars a month to get health insurance. These my 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 what the, the immigrant has fucking. They have free health care. One of the guys he has a fucking one of the guys I met. He's like, I need to go see my. Uh, What's the guy who does the heart cardiologist? Yeah, I want to see my cardiologist. You have a fucking cardiologist, bro. You just came here like a year ago. Mm. I don't have insurance. I don't have insurance. They get everything, all the benefits. Well, I mean, they have free do healthcare. you have major uh, medical? Who uh, you? Do you have like at least like in, in case of like a injury, you go to the ER? Zero. Oh man, I'm yeah, working the, on it right now. That's the one. Like all the other stuff, I'm working yeah. on it right now to get it because. Yeah, that's a dangerous you're one. Fucked, bro. Yeah. If you go into the hospital or something and yeah. you're not insured, they'll... I mean, the doctor stuff, prescriptions don't really matter, but like the major medical, I mean, that's what I have just as yeah. backup. It's like a five thousand dollar deductible or something, but it's just in case. But um, and if you ever need healthcare stuff, hit me up. And I mean, I can't send stuff in the mail because uh, of uh. it being in Mexico. But if you ever need to come down and get, you know, whatever you're. No, appreciate it. You can write your prescription stuff. So. I appreciate it, bro. Yeah, but yeah. I got to get health insurance. It's insane. yeah, for I sure. Can't even get health insurance, and everybody else, these guys could. I I'm scared to leave. I I I I was contemplating to leave New York City so many times. I'm, where am I going? I'll take you around Nashville. Check out, yeah. You know, see I'll if say, but for work, where am I going? I'm saying, you'll check you around Nashville. Maybe Nashville's your spot. <laughs> <laughs> Watch King uh, Nashville. Yeah. Watch King Nashville, Tennessee. No. Yeah. No. I think I love the hustle of New York City though. <laughs> yeah, no. The hustle is insane. Yeah. The hustle is I mean, what's your you know, people from New York have a you know, specific personality. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can you can tell and it's a good thing. You know, it's it's a it's, it's a lot of people see it as abrasive, but I think it's just uh well, culture. rude but nice at the same time. And yeah. We're always <laughs> rude but nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's about we right. Wanna get to your uh, always on the go, always fast paced, always like, you know. I tried, like I tried Miami, wasn't for me. I went to LA, too slow paced. The closest city to New York is Hong Kong. Mm. Like congestion wise, subway system is clean. New York subway system is trash, but I'm saying like they have the same subway system. Um, everything's congested. Everybody's on top of each other. Like exactly the same, like New York City. But besides that, I couldn't find a different place where I can actually like get used to a certain light, like. People who come from out of New York come, they get lost. Yeah. They get scared. They get lost. So many people. Nobody says, excuse me. You know, nobody cares. Like here, people are so nice. I walked in, everybody, hi, how oh, are yeah. you? I was like, whoa. It's very friendly. What do you want? You know? <laughs> yeah. Nobody Why says are you that, so but, nice to Yeah, me. nobody says, I was at the hotel. He let me in at 11 o'clock. Oh, really? There's your room. I was like, oh, wow. That was nice. 
It was crazy. Yeah. New York, sir, it's four o'clock. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Coin room is ready. Yeah. <laughs> they call it at 359. They can come. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, early check ins always exciting. So it's like, yes. here people are super nice. Yeah. Now, Nashville's a very friendly city, especially, you know, before it got big. Now we have a lot of people flying in and move, and they haven't got the memo. But uh, <laughs> you know, for that. the most part, it's it's pretty nice. I so. see that. But I'm saying you guys are old timers see it changing. It's probably so hard. Yeah, it is. I, you know, you like some of those changes because people are liking, you know, the city, the, that uh, the parts that I liked before it got big. That's why people are coming. You know, they love that live music aspect too. And, you know, that community amongst the musicians and things like that. But the, uh, you know, I don't like disrespect. You know, so that's the part that I don't, I don't love. Like, yeah, you know, well, new generation though. It's, uh, it's everywhere. It's not yeah, only here. It's not just here. It's everywhere. But that's the part I don't like. I don't like selling the soul of the city either. That that, that concerns me. Like giving tax breaks to companies from New York, for instance. I'll show you uh, uh, the corner of Broadway, Fifth uh, and Fifth uh, and Broadway. Uh, that was a New York developer, and you know, I thought it should be a local developer, and they gave him a big tax break to buy that property. And really, uh, they built a forty million dollar garage, sold them the land for like four or five million on the corner of Broadway, and they don't pay taxes, from my understanding. That's the story I got. It's like type of stuff, kind of. Yeah, that's not doing. I'm sure, somebody inside got a nice envelope for that. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, so they made a lot of money. Now, all that said, it's a great development. They did a great job with it. I I, I think it's awesome, but. Yeah, I How's still, real estate here? Uh, I mean, as far as like pricing, yeah, you're probably looking at. I bet you the average home is five hundred thousand. If I were to guess, how big? Two thousand square feet. Built so, or the lot? Built. I would say yeah. How built. big is the lot? Mm, less than a quarter acre. And when we when we leave here, I'll drive you around. Kind of, I'll point things out to you. Just kind of give you an idea. So, New York City, let's say. Uh, uh, if you live in that area, like where I live, or all with a community, or whatever, twenty footer, which is two thousand square feet home, not built, the lot size, mm -hmm. it's about one point two million. Yeah, yeah. Four thousand square feet is two and a half million. Wow. Not built. Yeah, not built. Size. The higher you go, the more you're gonna pay. Insane. Then you get zero property. Like I said, like you'll hear a neighbor sneeze. That's how close. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's one thing that's, I wish it was different. Like if you go out to Long Island or something, the further out you go from the city, the yeah. less you're going to pay. But they bang you there for um, real estate tax. You can pay up to $100,000 a year in real estate tax. Yeah. It's ridiculous. It really is ridiculous. That's New York City in a nutshell, right? Everything is expensive. Yeah. A night out in a nice restaurant, you go to a bar, it could cost you five grand. Wow. Yeah. Car, uh, parking in the city, thirty-five dollars an hour. It's insane. Manhattan is insane. It's crazy. People can still like afford it and buy it, and like now they 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 made a toll going from one side of town to the other. Manhattan, you pay twenty-five dollars just to drive. Wow! Because they want to cut all the cars out. That's ridiculous, man. Yeah, that's uh, I mean it's. I guess every area has their good and bad. A house like yours in my area is probably fifteen million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Huge. How many square feet is here? Uh, oh. gosh. You can't even count. It's so big, right? So, I, I, especially with the, I, I think we're gonna like heated and cooled area. Like it'll be when the new Reno's done, probably twelve thousand square feet. Dude, it's on an acre lot here too. It's, it's fucking huge. Yeah. You can't find a place like this. So you go out to the Long Island. Man. No, this is the only one of these. This was built in 1867. That's, I saw. She told me it was so, beautiful. It's an old school house. I love it. I mean, it's I've had it for 10 years. Had a special exception to run events here. So I was doing weddings and stuff like that. And then, but we haven't done a like a paid wedding in about three years um, after COVID. I was just like, I didn't want to do it anymore. And so, yeah, we're finally able to renovate the the main house and uh, live in, live in it all. They probably give you hell, right? Uh, what the neighborhood? No, to renovate. Oh gosh, yeah, it's a hell of a job. We're, we're all, we've been renovating forty thousand square feet of the hospital uh, for the last year too. So and then we're gonna start on the lab here uh, in January. So we'll have three renovation projects oh going at once. But 
you know, you get used to it. And um, it'll be awesome when it's done, you know. How long do you think you're going to finish? I bet you we'll be pretty close to being done by July. That's not bad. No. No, because it's really just, they don't have to build up. It's really just demo, which the demo's done. Yeah, but you know what you want. Sometimes people change. Oh, I don't want this. Oh, fuck this. Do this. Do that. No. Do that. You. Yeah, no, we have, we have like, uh, was it C C I G C C C G I drawings? Uh, like to where it's, you see it in 3D, what it's going to look like. Oh, no and, way. Uh, yeah, it's going to be be awesome. So, um, yeah, we're not going to change a whole lot. And we're doing a lot by hand. Like, I got a, my, my friend's an artist. She's flying in from New York. And um, she's doing Venetian plaster and 24 karat gold. Dude, uh, that's fucking that's, the walls. That's expensive as fuck. Yeah, but she's giving me a great deal. And so um, she's also managing the project for me. She's an artist. So uh, she's given a great deal, and I mean, I pay her monthly to manage a project, but uh, then she gave me a great deal on the Venetian Venetia plaster. Piece, like, fuck. It would probably cost me, for her, I would guess, two hundred fifty thousand yeah, to three hundred thousand for the walls. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, for twelve thousand square feet. Yeah. Yeah, and she's got, uh, or we've got sixteen thousand pounds of Italian Calicetta gold marble in the garage right now. Uh, so it's going to be all Calicetta gold. We have twenty-four karat gold chips in it. You know the. Oh my God. Uh, uh, the the um. Listen, work hard, play hard. That's the only. That's way, right. Man. That's I right. I believe also you make money, you spend it. What are you gonna save it for? Yeah, this is like my my dream to make this house. You know, give it its its glory. So, I can't wait. You know, I'm sure it's gonna be talk of the town also. Right? Yeah, we'll see next time you come in town. You can stay here in the guest house. Well, it's gonna be talk of the town, right? Oh Everybody, yeah. It's sick. She's like, yeah, he's the only man. I'm like, mansion. Fuck, let me see this place. <laughs> I was like so excited, like you know. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to in an office. This place is huge, man. Yeah, it's a really big house. You deserve it, bro. You're doing good. Thank you, brother. Thank you. You're helping well, people. Well, man, uh, we've been going at it for over three hours. No way. Yeah, man. So uh, it's been it's been a, a good conversation. It's been real. Thank this you. This is technically my longest podcast. I think the other one, what was before? Two hours and 30, 26 minutes? Bro, we could go on for another two hours. Oh, trust yeah. me. It's four o'clock already. We could, we, could, we could be rapping for a while, but... Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to fly in I and uh, I appreciate, getting to meet you. Uh, and, you paying for everything. Yeah, you're very bringing well. me down. I'm honored, brother. Really, it's actually one of the first podcasts I ever did. Like, like in legit. person. Yeah, like legit. Like somebody who's like you know. Well, I'm impressed. Yeah, well, the thanks. hospitality is great. I really appreciate everything. Well, yeah, I'm excited, excited that you're here, and let's uh, let's keep in touch here. Yes, sir. All right, thank, thank you, man.